Thank you, C. Thanks for joining me again, friend. Hey, Tasha. It's good to be back. Yeah, I uh, have been really looking forward to this because I really enjoyed our last conversation. And it, it sort of got cut off in, it was like three hours in, which is the longest <laughs> one I've done yet. Um, oh, no. But I was like, oh, man, we still got more to go. So this feels like a nice part two to that conversation. Awesome. Um, yeah. I was actually, I was reflecting on it and that episode was like a very, really good one for me and unusual in that, like, in several respects. And I was trying to think like, what was it that made it different? And I think, um, I feel like you brought this energy of like, one, like, I like you, uh, which, you know, most people bring, <laughs> but, Sweet. Uh, but second, like, and this felt really important. You kind of had this energy of like, Hey, I am down to talk for as long as you want. Like if we're talking, we're vibing, <laughs> like I will be here. Like I'm in no rush. Like I'm having a great time. I'm just here talking. And um, I felt like that was such yeah, a good yeah. energy to bring into a conversation. So thanks for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're welcome. It was fun. I remember having, it was a while ago, but I remember it being fun. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Just having a good time. Definitely. Um, mm -hmm. So um, maybe to get started, um, we just had vibe camp a couple weeks ago and yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> are you back in seattle yeah i'm back in seattle now. Gotcha. i went back and i didn't i didn't do any of the after parties so uh -huh. i'm a little i'm a little jealous of the people who are like oh we all the best conversations happened at the after parties i'm like i know uh -huh. i know uh -huh. i know i knew that was going to happen and i yeah mm -hmm. sad times what what how was vibe camp for you and uh how has it been sort of post vibe camp yeah. Um, so I, I talked, I wrote a little bit about this in the Substack post that I just yeah, posted. Yeah, it's a great post. Uh, thank you. Yeah, basically it was great. I um, I just talked a lot, just really a lot. And I was just having a great time the whole time. And I really enjoyed getting to do that. That was just so satisfying. Uh, like, I just, the only thing was I wish it could have been longer. I mean, of course, I think everyone was like, I wish it could have been longer. Uh, but it was so nice getting to talk to so many people. It was so nice getting to talk to people I had known already, people I had known from Twitter, people I had just met. It was just like, everything was just so good. I felt like the whole crowd just kind of uh, like, how do I describe it? Like snowballed this like overall atmosphere of warmth and openness. And it just kind of kept building and building over the course of the weekend. That was really, that was really fun to get to to experience and just be inside and everyone just seemed so happy i saw so many people with just so many smiling faces and i was just like oh, it just felt really good yeah definitely and and how has it been kind of since have, have you had any like i know a lot of people were like worried about like having a come down or yeah how, how has it been sort of integrating that experience so i think it's been pretty smooth i did notice so like i i so i scheduled a lot of calls uh, which I've I, I burnt out on them a little bit. I have, this is my last call <laughs> of mm -hmm. the week. Uh -huh. Great. Cheers. Which is great. I think I had 14, for, anyway, just a bunch of calls. Um, and I noticed that on the calls, I was like watching my own face and like my face was pretty sure my face was super relaxed during back. And then I noticed this tension creeping into my face <laughs> as I did more calls. Like it was like my brows were, was furrowing and I was like, that's weird. I don't know why that's happening. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I've, I've been keeping busy. I've had a lot of stuff I've been wanting to do, like a lot of people I wanted to talk to, which who I did talk to mostly, and then stuff I wanted to write on Twitter and then stuff I, I wanted to write this Substack post. And so it's all just, I've, I've been keeping very busy. Uh, I haven't felt like deprived, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and also I like, I recently started some healthier habits, you know, like I started going on for, out for walks more and things like that. And that's been, that's been good too. That's been a lot better than, you know, just being holed up here, like either being on Twitter or like watching TV or whatever. So that, that's also helped, I think, just being outside more. Totally. Totally. I saw you writing a little bit on your Twitter account afterwards about like something along the lines of like community community building and like you were talking about how like Twitter can't sustain the bandwidth for like the possible conversations that could and should be happening and yeah. I'd be curious to hear more about that and kind of what you're thinking along those lines. So I felt like I had some really nice conversations especially uh 
after Vibecamp technically ended. And I had one really nice, con I had several really nice conversations with a group who very kindly pulled me into their kind of Airbnb group to just hang out while I waited for my flight. And then I had another really nice conversation on my flight with someone else who had the same connection that I did through Salt Lake City. Wow. Uh, so, which was just totally random, but like very, very cool. Uh -huh. And like, the thing that struck me about those conversations was that like, we had, like, we sort of had things to, that the other person really like, that like, the other person like, really was like excited to hear like, oh, that idea is like not an idea I've had, or like that, that, that perspective is like not a perspective like considered. And like, just in not that much time, like we had this sort of exchange of perspectives that like was very, I felt like very inspired and like enlivened by, by that happening. And it like, didn't even take that long. And I'm just mm. like, wow, this could just keep happening. Like there's so many, there are people here who are in, in you know, in, in teapot who are like into so many different cool things. There's like people who are into therapy things, people who are into meditation things, people who are into magic things, people who are into like acting things. Like there's so many different kinds of like really interesting expertise that I guess is like relevant to sort of this broad question of like, what is it to be a human? Like how do we sort of excel at the project of being human together? And I, I, I like, I have, the sense more now than I did before of like, oh, there's like a lot of really rich exchange of ideas that could be happening. And not just ideas, like a really rich exchange of like vibes, you know, and energies and just, I saw so much also at Vibe Camp of just people just being so delighted to meet each other. It's like, oh, I know your tweets, your tweets are great. This is so wonderful. And just like, I just wanted like, you know, when you're in person in a group of 400 people, like there can be, you know, 200 parallel conversations happening at the same time. Uh, and meanwhile, on public Twitter, there's kind of like, at on any given day, there'll be like a few, maybe big conversations happening, like a few threads where people are sort of actively like, there's just isn't that much, you just can't pay attention, just, you just can't really have 200 conversations on Twitter in a day, because the timeline would just, people just don't want to tweet that much. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. They just, they would just feel shy about, about cluttering the, the timeline, just like, ah, there's just, there just needs to be more, <laughs> like, mm. more conversations happening yeah yeah do you have any aspirations for specific projects or like next steps or things along the lines of community building coming out of five camp i was really excited to see that people were thinking about doing regional events and even just like in the discord people are organizing little like regional meetups and there's there's one here around Seattle next week. So that's oh, cool. amazing. So that's already, that feels great to me. I think as long as, as long as that kind of stuff keeps happening, like I basically trust that sort of the momentum will keep going forward. Uh, so one thing I, I am thinking about, which I also tweeted a bit about is this kind of like, uh, there was this poetry reading event mm. at Vibe Camp and I went and I actually I had a little poem I wrote a couple of years ago that I wanted to present, but also I was curious to see what, people were doing and and people people wrote people people like recited some cool poems i'm like wow there's some cool stuff going on here there's like i was sort of struck overall by this sense that like uh so i also tweeted briefly about this so darbra dawn once described teapot to me as like people who should have been theater kids and i like i just really mm -hmm. love that description like I that's really a great description have been have been pondering it because like i okay so here's a little a little uh like what that brings up for me is like i uh when i was in eighth grade i think my middle school put on greece and i like listen to the soundtrack. It's like, oh my God, musical. This is like my first exposure to musicals or something. I was like, this is so cool. This is like so interesting. And then again, in high school, I think they put on West Side Story. West Side Story, one of the years I was in high school. And I was like, oh, I listened to the soundtrack. And I think we actually watched the whole thing in a class once. And I just was like, oh, this is so cool. Like, oh, there's so many like musicals. There's all this dancing and there's all this big dramatic emotion. And this is so exciting. And then I never tried out for any, like I never. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. I was just like, I'm just going to be over here in my corner. I'm going to go to math club. I'm going to mm. do math. I'm mm. like, I can't. I just like could not work up the courage, even though I, on some level I really, really wanted to. And so that's what that brings up for me. And like, 
yeah, there's just, a, there's still a lot for me there around like, oh, wouldn't it be great to like be on stage and get to perform and to get to like show everyone my singing voice and also my emotion, my emotional range. Mm. <laughs> like, <laughs> mm. mm -hmm. There is still a part of me that harbors, that harbors that dream in some way. And, and I got that sense from the poetry reading that like, oh, there are these, these, the, at least the people who are here at the poetry reading, there are these like, there are these like artists inside of that really want to come out. And that was, that was really cool to me. And like, I have felt like, in like a sort of, um, how do I say it? Uh, yeah, like, an, like there was an artist inside of me that's been trying to come out and that I mm. felt like um, shy about that. Like, oh, is that, is this really, am I allowed to do this? <laughs> like, is this mm. really for me? And um, also this thing that Sasha Shapin mentioned to me once of like, he does writing coaching stuff. And he was like, oh, there's just, there's so many, like I work with these people who are powerful writers who have so many things to say and they're just like, ah, oh, should I, am I, am I a writer though? Mm, like, is this mm. really? So I, I came away with this sense of like, ah, there's like, there's people here who could, I think do amazing artistic work, but who are like, who are, who are, aren't getting the encouragement that they, really need and like maybe I'm even one of those people I don't know I don't mm. know if I could do it's a little it feels presumptuous of me like I think I could do great work but like mm. you know like maybe I could do some cool stuff <laughs> we can all always stuff. do more and better things than we're already there doing we I think yeah. like I know I can do more and better things and like I'm I'm proud of what I've done so far but it's like yeah yeah, yeah. so I think that's true for everybody yeah so one direction which is to say the one direction that really excites me is the idea that we could like like um like motivate and encourage each other to, for example, pursue artistic passions. Like mm -hmm. people have been like, oh, I always wanted to be a filmmaker. I always wanted to be a dancer. I always wanted to like, I would love it if we could become, you know, like a, like a kind of incubator for that sort of thing. Just like, yeah, that mm -hmm. sounds great. Like here's, here's this other person in Teapot who's an expert in that and probably be help, happy to like give you pointers. Mm. And that's an example of a thing that I think could be really cool. I also think there are probably potentials for like, more intellectual collaborations or like philosophical collaborations or like maybe altruistic projects that people want to work on. Like I, I, I bet that there's a lot of different kinds of collaboration that could happen in this network. Mm. And it would be cool to like somehow try to encourage this. I just think that would be really fun. Definitely. Um, one, one angle on that that also feels like a thing is I would love if we became better able to encourage each other's financial independence mm -hmm, that would be mm -hmm, very cool mm -hmm. because i think like the more of us can sort of feel feel free to like uh to be able to support ourselves doing what we love the more resources that frees up for everyone else like that person can now like spend more of their time and resources helping other people and like it could be this like whole nice cascading effect and it's just I, there's there's i see possibility there i don't know i don't know if this will happen but i would love to to see it happen like mm -hmm. i've already seen some of this with like you know michael ashcroft taking off and like with visa like dispensing free business advice on Twitter mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. things like that it's like man this is so great and also i bet there's more of this that could be happening totally so, yeah. totally yeah I'm, I, I'm what's that oh sorry i was going to say like visa has had a vision in this direction for a while you know he has the, the dominoes.jpg like golden mm -hmm. age like we're gonna build a whole scene here and i guess so i guess the one way to summarize uh is that i'm just like yeah visa's right uh -huh. <laughs> we should just do this thing yeah it's, it's hell yeah about. i'm very here for that uh i feel really definitely similar thoughts about what's possible and i think vibe camp was like a major milestone along that way and uh i think rich bartlett said something about that on twitter he's like yeah this was like we got to the next domino you know and yeah, uh yeah it yeah. really feels like that and I'm, I'm really glad that you're thinking about that and and in particular like looking to the whole scene and uh yeah i don't know for me in the last like month or two it's it's kind of become viable to be doing what i'm doing uh full-time for at least oh. the next year or so and so it's like nice. yeah i can start to look more broadly to what's happening and see how I can help. So that's yeah. really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. I'm really glad Rich is talking to more people too, because like I've, I, I came across his micro solidarity stuff a couple of years ago, maybe 
three or four years ago. I was like, wow, this is so cool. He's talking about how to like actually organize people and how to like actually build intimacy with people that you like engage ongoingly with and collaborate with ongoingly instead of like, you know, the stuff I've been used to before that was sort of more uh, authentic relating type things. It's like, oh, we'll get together for, we'll have this weekend event, we'll get together and we'll like share about our feelings, whatever, and it'll feel like really warm and fuzzy. But then and the disperse. weekend just kind of ends. Yeah, and then it just disperses. You just yes. go fuck off and you never see each other again. And those groups, those groups never stay in touch. <laughs> uh-huh. been, that's yeah. happened to me several times. And it's very sad. And, and Rich's stuff felt to me like, oh, like, what if we didn't do that? What if we stayed together, like, learned how to stay together and like learned how to keep relating and learned how to keep like, uh, just how to keep being together. Um, and so I, 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 I saw on Twitter a couple of weeks ago that he had a conversation with Brooke after Vibe Camp about like how to sort of like bring some more of that stuff into, into these circles. And that's very exciting to me. I'm like, I'm so glad that Rich is here. I'm so glad that he's talking to us about this because he's like an, an expert, you know, he's been doing this for a long time. Uh, and so that, that, that's an example of just the like, the, the sort of the amount of like latent expertise that I feel is in the network that's sort of waiting to like be properly integrated and like, yeah, it's really, and I'm excited. <laughs> totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. Microsolidary has been been great to learn about, and I'm I'm happy that it's it's spreading and Rich is doing really good work with that. Um, yeah. Maybe maybe also zooming into you in particular, and like you just posted the Substack post the other day, and um, yeah, I would be curious to hear more about what writing that post was like for you, and also mm-hmm. what you're hoping for, what your what sort of plans are for your writing going forward. Yeah, I'd be curious to hear cool, about that. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so this just for for reference, for those of you listening, the post is called Five Tips for How to Have Great Conversations. Exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Three of them. It's so great. The, yeah, exactly. It's very important. So the, the original impetus for the post, um, it just kind of it just it just kind of came on me all at once. First, I was think I was I was first just thinking about. Right after Vibe Camp, I was like, ah, I wish I had written a post right before Vibe Camp, giving people tips for how to have great conversations. Mm-hmm. Like I actually, like initially it was it was completely straightforward. I was like, wouldn't it have been nice if I had written a post about how to have great conversations? And because I had thoughts, I had I had various thoughts about like advice that could have been helpful to people. Uh, and then I noodled on that idea for a little bit. And then I was like, ah, but like, it's kind of lame when someone just like, gives you advice in the form of like commands where they're like, mm. ah, you should be vulnerable <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> like you should, it's like, what does that even mean? You know, like, what does that like, like, especially like, what does that even mean to someone who hasn't done it? Like you can go, you know, you can write an article, be like, Hey, here's, you know, I believe in the power of vulnerability. I think it's for sure there, but it's like, uh, you know, I do in fact believe in something like that. And like, I came to those beliefs through some experiences that I had. So then I was thinking about, okay, the real thing is not the advice. The real thing is like the experiences that caused me to generate the advice. So then I was thinking about like, what if instead of writing advice, I converted all of the advice into experiences. Mm. Um, so then it became this much more kind of um, memoiristic thing. And then I just started writing that because I wanted to see what would happen. And the more I wrote it, the more I liked it. I was like, oh, this is great. Like I am actually really enjoying writing this. I think like I actually am making the points that I wanted to make, but much more uh, experientially than if mm-hmm. I had just kind of like written down a list of, of advice. Mm. And then I just kept writing it and I just kept enjoying it. And I was especially, uh, so it's, it's, bur- it's broken you know, up into these like five tips. And tip number four, I just, some, some, I just for whatever reason, decided to start writing about my experience of lockdown. Mm. And mm-hmm. There is, it is tied to the, to the theme of conversations. It's about like what happened when I stopped talking to people. And that just felt really nice to get to write. There was like some kind of, some kind of like reflection on that experience that I hadn't really gotten to do until I wrote this section. So it's actually my favorite section mm. of the piece where I just talk about just like how much it sucked to be in lockdown for me basically. Mm. Uh, but I, there was something really that, there was something that I really got out of like being really detailed about the experience and sort of painting this whole vivid picture of like, okay, like it's easier for me to say that I was lonely, but like, what is that really like? Lonely is like 
it's just one word by itself. Like, how could I paint sort of a more vivid picture of like the kind of isolation that I felt like I was in? And I think I, I did a pretty good job of that. And I'm pretty happy with that section the way mm. it turned out. Um, it just, it felt nice to get to write it. it. Just felt like, ah, okay, here's an experience that I had I'm getting to describe it. And I'm hoping, you know, maybe some other people will, it'll help other people sort of reflect on their own experiences. Like I, I actually don't have a clear sense of whether it was like that bad for other people or whether people had a much worse time or whether people had a much better time. I think it was probably particularly bad for me because I was both depressed and didn't have a job, <laughs> which was uh -huh. just an awful uh -huh. combination. Um, probably many people were depressed, but I bet many, most people at least had jobs. So at least they had to like see their coworkers regularly, if only through, you know, Zoom calls and stuff. But like I had and I didn't really write about this aspect, but like no, nobody needed me to be anywhere. I mm. was I was useless mm. the whole time. And that really ground on, on me over time. It was just like, yep, I am mm. unnecessary. <laughs> I am an unnecessary person right now. Mm. Uh, and that really like um, kind of synergized with the depression in a bad way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That passage in particular brought me back to, we met up that summer uh in berkeley that was uh before vibe camp the last time we saw each other in person and like i really enjoyed our conversation but it was also like pretty clear that you're like having a really hard time with yeah uh, <clears throat> with the lockdown and um mm. yeah i guess it, ma it makes me happy to see how you're doing now and yeah. sort of uh, the trajectory seems good coming out coming out of the lockdown so yeah yeah, yeah thank you mm. i do feel like i'm doing better it's nice. Yeah. The other two, yeah, maybe I just want to flag like two passages that really stuck with me from it. Well, first off, it was just it was nice. it was very, very vulnerable in a particular way. It was, I, I, I mean, I don't know how it landed for other people, but for me, it was very much like this is demonstrating a kind of masculinity that I would want to aspire to, where it's just oh. like honest and earnest and like real and not hiding anything and also not like creepy or uh it's just like <laughs> here's who i am you know like yeah yeah i love that um thank you yeah and um there was the part where you're talking about um i think oh yeah like people people having a conversation where like you're just like using people and you're like talking to yourself or your memory or your concepts of people and not yeah, actually yeah. to the real person in front of you. And the description yeah. there is like very vivid and excellent. <laughs> um, and just felt, I was like, yeah, that, that's what it's like. <laughs> you said it, <laughs> <laughs> you said it. So I wanted to send it to some people that I feel like that around, but I was like, oh, that's, I'm not, I don't, that wouldn't be very nice, but uh, you know, anyway. There was that and then um uh -huh. yeah the other part that really this uh, and maybe it would be better to circle back to this later um but just want to flag it at the very least um mm -hmm. um uh was you you sort of alluded to this in passing but you said that one of the things you talked about at vibe camp was the ethics of treating people so warmly they accidentally fall in love with you and that yeah. is <laughs> That is a thing that we should talk about when we talk about meta because oh, that's, man. I mean, I think if you do a lot of meta people, people fall in love with you. And so that's something I have to be aware of. Uh, and uh, especially teaching it, it's like, you oh, know. Um, yeah. So, but I am hoping to dive deeper into meta later in the conversation. So maybe we can just bookmark that and come back. Um, but yeah, such an amazing that, piece. So thank you. Thank you. That one is sort of funny because it's a summary of like a very short conversation. Like we did not spend too long on that topic, and that's not really how they phrased it. It's just, it's just a, it's like a slight rephrasing of, uh -huh. of what we talked about. That anyway, it's, it, yeah, <laughs> it, it amuses me a lot to think about anyway. Definitely. And yeah, there's. I, I yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that uh, once it become once it is part of the meta conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. What, um, what is your sense of what you'd like to do with your writing and your Substack going forward? That is a good question. So, like, I don't. I have no idea how realistic this is, but the dream i would love to be able to support myself doing some kind of mix of like writing and coaching that would be really cool if i could do that um, 
it would be, yeah, it would just be, those are, those are things that I enjoy doing and I would rather not have to have like a normal day job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if, if I could somehow make a living doing this or similar things, that would be great. Uh, right now I feel very experimental with the sub stack. I'm like, I don't, I, there's a lot of different kinds of writing I want to try. I think there's, there's things I could write that are probably going to be way worse than this piece because they're just going to be things I haven't really tried to do. Like I'd like to try to write short fiction. I haven't really done that mm. uh, since high school and it's probably going to suck at first. So mm. you guys are going to have to deal with me writing some, some probably not very good short fiction for a while. Mm. Um, I'd also like to try just some, just a bunch of weird experimental ideas I have, just things that are not even easily classifiable as like, uh, yeah, what's an example? So I, 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 I thought of a piece I wanted to try writing. Um, no, actually, I'm just gonna, that's gonna be a surprise. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But for example, um, a general theme that really interests me that I'd like to try talking more about is something like the experience of being on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, because we're all very, of course, we're all very online people. We, like this is happening online right now. You know, uh, the Twitter community is like this very online thing. And this even for me goes back way back to when I was like probably seven was probably the first time I got on the internet, you know, on dial up mm. back in, back in the nineties. And there's, a, there, there really is a specific kind of person who like grew up on the internet and like, that's a relatively recent phenomenon. There's just aren't like probably there are probably the upper age range of people who can say they grew up on the internet. It's like, what 35 40 or something hmm. maybe maybe not even then and like i it, it feels like a very unique experience to me and like people who grew up on the internet in that way i think have a unique set of kind of relationships to the internet as like a thing and like a place and i feel like i see so little art about that hmm. I, I there's a there's a there's a handful there's a couple there's this uh, Patricia Lockwood wrote this beautiful essay called The Communal Mind, which is about the experience of using Twitter. And mm. it's like so mm. good. You guys should look it up. Anyone, mm. anyone, uh, anyone listening to this, uh, The Communal Mind by Patricia Lockwood. Let me just mm. double check that I have that right. Uh, you might have to get past a paywall to read it. And I think she, I, I think there's a, there's a version of it on YouTube, which I have not seen, but yeah, it's just about the experience of using Twitter. I just think it's one of the most beautiful things anyone's ever written about the internet and about mm. the experience of being on the internet, uh, which, yeah, so it, it strikes me as both, first of all, it's just such a, such, a, such a fact of our lives. Like just our lives have been so dominated by the fact of the internet. Mm. And then comparing that to just like how little art there is about that experience, it just like really frustrates me. So I would like to, somehow this is a very big intention just write more about the experience of being online mm. uh, and one version of that is like i would like to write more kind of fiction that really engages with the experience of being online like and i've also seen very little of this but like for example you know when people write creepy pastas that are like oh what if there was a video game but it was haunted you know like i don't know if you've seen these things but like the haunted copies of of, of super mario 64 mm, that like mm. are super glitchy and weird like that stuff is actually amazing i think it's really cool mm. and just i would like to try my hand at, at writing some stuff like that at some point i don't know if it's going to be any good but like i want i want to try it um, so that's one example and i guess sort of the general theme related to what you said about the subsect post just being like real and honest it's just like i feel like the only thing i can really do is talk about my experiences you know ultimately all i can really be like is here's what it was like for me mm -hmm. and i just would like to do that more with the Substack, and i do think a large part of that is going to be here's what it was like for me to be online here's mm -hmm. what it was like for me to be on the internet as i have been here's what it was mm -hmm. like for me to grow up on the internet and have nostalgia about the way the internet used to be when I was a kid, ways mm. it's not, mm. you know, when we used to have flash videos <laughs> and we had PHP BB forums, you know, and like AIM and MSN Messenger and all this stuff. Like there's a very specific vein of nostalgia there that mm. like a very specific age range of people have access to. And I just find that fascinating. Totally. Um, I, I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm rambling a little, but just one more on, bit on that. There is this, I've only seen one story I can think of that 
like evokes some of that nostalgia for me. It's called the Northern Caves. It's on AO3, I think. And I don't want to spoil it too much, but part of what, what the author does in that story is invent a fictional forum discussing a fictional series of books mm. and it's like the most perfect evocation of form mm. culture i've ever seen mm. it's like so beautiful and it fills me with like really specific intense nostalgia for the time in my life where i spent a lot of time on forums mm. and i just think it's so well done and it's it it's i feel sad when i think about like how difficult it will be to preserve that experience because it could easily just like disappear into the sands of time if no one takes the time to like record it to be like this is what it was like mm. in 2004 or whatever when we were on the internet during this very specific era uh, so that's something i'd like to try mm. that sort of thing yeah i i love that um both both of those intentions both like to sort of find a livelihood that feels good for you and then also um, this last part that you're talking about with like describing your experience of being online and um, something I've really noticed, especially in the last year is like, there's no real precedent or like guide for many of the situations I find myself in on a daily basis living <laughs> online, you know, yeah. like, yeah, I'm like, I don't know how to navigate this. And there's no like, I don't even know who to ask and there's no stories <laughs> yeah. that like tell me how to there's no like elders that are like here's yeah. how you deal with like bad replies or like friends <laughs> that are having manic episodes or like your friend is freaking out or um you know you have this crush on this person on the other side of the world or yeah. you know like I don't know any number of the situations I find myself in um yeah yeah and uh yeah I would love to see like I, I feel very nourished by people reflecting on their experiences in any form that um, acknowledges the perspective of being like very online you know it's like yeah, yeah it's yeah. like uh, because it's even there's even like I I feel sometimes ashamed to admit like how online I am to people <laughs> it's like I'm very online like no I'm yeah. very online yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it feels like recently I've been describing it as like I feel like I live on the internet primarily and then I sometimes inhabit a body or a location <laughs> but like it really feels like that sometimes and I you yeah, know I'm yeah, yeah. I've worked on being embodied and like I do tai chi mm -hmm. every day and I dance yeah, a lot yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah. but like the internet is where my homies are at you know <laughs> yeah yeah it's difficult it's yeah. tricky it's yeah. tricky I mean so I I we could go into this more later but like I've been in this online men's group Mm. And we've been doing a dopamine detox, which mm. I also mentioned on Twitter, and somehow it went slightly viral, which uh -huh. is very unexpected. But um, uh, sort of I cut out a, overall this time, yeah. Yeah, I think positively overall. So I, I cut out porn, masturbation, TV, movies, and video games are the big things, and I conspicuously did not cut out Twitter. <laughs> and one could one could look. I mean, several people did say this. They were like, "Why didn't you cut out Twitter? Mm -hmm. Like, you should have cut out Twitter, or it doesn't count if you don't cut out Twitter." And they do have a point. I mean, I did notice that like all of the energy that would have gone into all those other things is now going towards Twitter. Um, and you're still and on Slack tricky. too, right? The, the yeah, I am still on Slack, Slack, but I yeah, but I've been I've been checking it less. That's been less of a less mm -hmm. of a thing. Twitter has really been the main thing, mm -hmm. and. It's tricky because this, especially because this was right after Vibe Camp, and I was like, I really want to talk about Vibe Camp stuff right mm -hmm. now. This just mm -hmm. seems like a really rich time. Like everyone's so so energized and, and revitalized. Totally. Like, so I wanted, I I made the call that like I was not going to quit Twitter. I was like going to stay, and I was going to talk about stuff that seemed important to me. But also, I was going to try to. So I've I've been almost totally ignoring the timeline. Mm -hmm. I just like have barely read the timeline. And I try to check my notifications only once a day. Mm -hmm. Amazing. <laughs> this Amazing. is my current, uh, so, which means that I now take like a day to reply to things, but mm -hmm. so it goes. And I think that's been going okay. But it's like you say, it's like, this is still where all my friends are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. um, it reminds me a little, so like, this is probably 10 years ago, five or 10 years ago, I read about like people who tried to quit World of Warcraft, you know, mm -hmm. people who are due to World of Warcraft and they tried to quit it. And I guess at the time I was like a little confused. I was like, oh, how could, how hard could that possibly be? But then they started talking about, you know, oh, this is where my friends are. Like mm. I am in a guild and we like raid together. I don't know what those words mean. I hope I'm using them correctly. <laughs> I uh -huh. think it's when you defeat a boss. Anyway, um, 
So that's like, and I read actually a, a, an article about this at some point that had painted this really interesting kind of sympathetic portrait of a guy who was just like, this was his social life. And he mm. like tried meeting up with one of his guildmates once. And it was just kind of awkward because mm. all, all they could really talk about was World of Warcraft. Mm -hmm. And that was like kind of the only thing going on in their lives. And I think, I think later in the, in the article, he's like, he finally manages to quit. And he's like, I'm going to, I'm going to work out now. I'm going to like make something out of my life. You know, I'm going to do something else other than this. Uh, I think Twitter is better than that. <laughs> I don't think it's quite as bad on Twitter. I do think we're building and doing real things. I mean, Vibe Camp is, is probably one of the strongest demonstrations of this. Like, oh yeah, we like came together and we're going to do it again. And it's going to be, it's going to be cool. So like, I, I think we're doing things that are going to like, you know, penetrate into, into IRL, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is this similar kind of, kind of, um, what's the word? kind of tension between like, oh, Twitter is so unhealthy, it's like so unhealthy in all these ways. Like they're trying to like get me addicted to scrolling. There's all these like gamification, whatever. And then on the other hand, but this is still where all my friends are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally, totally. Yeah, I think it's, um... oh yeah, Visa said this at one point. It was like, he said, um... I forget exactly how he framed it, but it was something like, I'm going to come out and say something controversial here, which is like, social media is good, actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I was like, yes, yes. like, yes. <sighs> uh, you know, and I think this this sort of fits into a larger point from him of like, that I've talked about on the podcast before, but of like, oh, people don't actually know how to use social media and he wants mm -hmm. to like demonstrate new ways to use it. And, um, sure, yeah. and like, for me, I'm clear from my perspective in my life that like Twitter is by far a net positive, like, yes, some costs, some side effects, but like mm -hmm. above and beyond, so obviously clear a net positive. Oh, yeah. uh, and yeah. it's like, mm -hmm. anyway, I, I think your decision makes total sense. And yeah. also it sounds like you're doing really good stuff overall with this like men's group detox and like that, that oh, seems yeah. like the perfect compromise to me, so. Yeah, it's been it's been really good. I I'm I I'm gonna write about it more later. It hasn't ended yet, uh, so officially I I can end the detox now if I want. But I decided to just keep it going for a while, just to see what would happen. And it's still going fine. I'm still just like, yep, I still don't need those things. It's not a problem. I'm just gonna talk to people and then journal and then mm. look at ducks uh -huh. and look looking at a lot of ducks. Incredible. Nice. <laughs> what, what's that What's that been like for you? That like it's been so overwhelmingly positive that you want to keep it going. Uh, I feel more focused. This, this is something I, I, I wanted to wait until I tried to articulate this, but I guess I'll try to articulate it now. Like, so the perspective of the men's group, which I totally agree with, is that all of these like dopamine things, you know, like not just TV or movies or porn, but also like weed for some people, alcohol for many people and like, uh, for dating apps, apparently, for, I was surprised how many people were like, I'm going to quit dating apps. Like, mm. well, is that really a thing you can get addicted to? Mm. <laughs> like, but apparently you totally can. And like people specifically talked about Instagram. They're like, yeah, I'm going to quit scrolling models on Instagram. Like, oh yeah, I guess that's totally a thing that you can right. get addicted to. So the perspective of the men's group is that all this stuff is basically a distraction from feeling things. And I'm just like, yes, that's it. That's true. That's how it is. I wrote about that on Twitter once. <laughs> so I, was, I, was, I was happy. I was happy that we like, like, you know, centered, like what synchronized that up, that we like synced up on that. And then their, their perspective for what to do about that was like, okay, well, so you have all these addictions and here's what we're going to do. You're going to quit all of them simultaneously so that there's no like wiggle room, right? Like, mm -hmm. so because there's also a very common, I feel like this this feels to me still like an under uh, underappreciated thing about how addictions work, which is like, if you try to get rid of one of them, the oh. energy will often just go into another one because totally. it's, if insofar as it really is just about avoiding some uncomfortable feelings, you're just like, I'm just gonna avoid this by any means necessary is what I'm gonna do. Mm. Um, and so like, so their perspective is like, okay, we're gonna, you're gonna quit all of them at once. All of the things that you like, are distracting yourself with. And then some uncomfortable emotions are gonna come up and then you're gonna to come to us with those emotions. Like mm. we, are, we are pledging to support you through the experience of confronting these uncomfortable emotions that you've been, that you've been avoiding. And like that's, that promise is like how you're going to feel safe enough to quit mm. everything. Huh. Is because you know that we will be here to support you. And I think that's such a powerful combination. It's like legitimately really cool. 
I mm. think it's really, it's an exciting thing that they've, like an exciting combination that they've, that they've hit on. Mm. Uh, so I am planning on writing about that once I'm done with my mm. own personal experience, which is not done yet. Um, so that's, that's like the, the structure. And then I've actually been doing it and mm -hmm. it's been just good. Like I, I felt like I was already just about ready to quit everything. I was like, okay, I'm still playing this game that I was playing over lockdown. And it has this, it's one of these games that like has like a stamina mechanic. So they like incentivize you to keep playing regularly or else you, like, mm. you know, you waste resources and it's just like, it used to be fun in a lot of ways. And it, it kind of kept me going <laughs> through mm. lockdown, but at this point I was like, I don't, I'm ready to, to, to leave this behind. Like I don't, <laughs> now it's just some like kind of residual habit that I don't really, that I don't really want anymore. Um, and I was also, I was like watching TV, which was like, okay. But I was like, I was already noticing that I wasn't enjoying the experience that much. I was like, this is, this is okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I rewatched Brooklyn Nine-Nine and that was great. And then everything else was like, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then with the porn and masturbation stuff, like I have, uh, I have done like 30 day fasts from that stuff. And it was good those times when I did it, I was like, oh, I felt more energized. I felt hornier, which is really nice. Mm. And just kind of like less, yeah, just energized and more horn hornier and more energized, which is great. And I was like, yeah, I could do that again. That sounds fun. <laughs> so everything just kind of came together. Like this men's group just kind of showed up at the perfect time for me. I was like, okay, yeah, I'm ready to like get rid of all this stuff and to like anything that comes up I'll just deal with because I have the tools to deal with that stuff now. What kind of uh, stuff what, came up for you? Pretty much just a bunch of feelings about women. Like it's really it's mm. just all feelings yeah. about women. Uh -huh. Um, which I, you know, I was like, okay, great. I I really want to face this stuff. And and I did a little bit. And it's mm -hmm. not, it's not done yet. There's definitely still some more stuff, but I was like, ah, okay okay, there's all these feelings and now mm -hmm. I get to feel them and here we are. And that's just been good. And it hasn't been overwhelming or anything. I haven't felt like devastated to be like, oh, I'm like crushed under the feet. Like, it's just been like, oh, okay. Yeah, I still have some hangouts about this. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then let's sit with that. And then let's, you know, like name some stuff and like be with some stuff. And that's all just been, it's just been going fine. Mostly my experience has just been like, oh good. I freed up so much time and attention Mm. that I was spending on this other stuff and it's just felt really refreshing for my for my for my attention to be on fewer things now my mm. attention is on like calls and writing and girls mm. <laughs> and ducks uh -huh. <laughs> it's just like not that many things anymore I'm like this is this feels nice like I have felt I felt like that my 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 focus or my attention has been so scattered for such a long time you know in this mm. in this ADHD way that, that I'm sure many many of us have have experienced mm. of like having a million tabs open all the time being like you have these million things that i want to think about and look at or whatever and it for me the detox has been has been a process of like just gathering all of that scattered energy and then being like okay but but i always i would like to take the time right now to just kind of focus on like three things mm. and just kind of let everything else fall aside mm. and that's been happening and it's just been really nice mm. I, I hope you don't mind me saying this but i, I saw you say that like you were exploring journaling privately which was kind of new for you yeah. and i'd be curious yeah, yeah. to hear what that was like for you yeah so i have this little mold scheme that uh one of the one of the men's group coaches is like a like a world expert in journaling or something mm, he, wow he does journaling coaching where he like okay. teaches, coaches people how to journal real good wow and he was like I asked him early in the program i was like okay so i have i do have a kind of journaling practice but it mm -hmm. happens online um it happens in this group of other people and what do you like do you, would you recommend getting like a private handwritten journal he was like yes absolutely i would because uh, he says something interesting about how the just the, the the fact that like handwriting is slower sort of forces you to slow down mm. and like be be with the experience a little more mm. and he also i haven't done this but he specifically recommended journaling in cursive mm. because the writing in cursive you get to like the experience of writing a word down is, is much more continuous and you can wow. flow and I haven't done that, but I have noticed how annoying it is to have to keep interrupting myself to form new letters on the page. <laughs> mm. So like he has a point. If if I, if it was effortless for me to switch to cursive, I would I would have done so because I really would it would be a lot better if I could just flow the words out of the pen. Mm. Uh, but as far as the actual experience goes, it's been good. Uh, I really like having it in this little 
convenient book because I can carry it around different places. Mm -hmm. And just having it in a handwritten journal at all means I can journal without looking at a screen, which is Mm -hmm. really great at Mm -hmm. night because then I can journal at night without having to like, you know, blue light or whatever. Right. So that's been really cool. And the privacy has been uh, not a huge deal. Like there are a couple things in there that I wouldn't have written uh, readily to other people, but uh, over the privacy hasn't been the, the most important thing. The most important thing has just been kind of the convenience of having this around without and not having to pull up a tab mm. uh, and not having to like engage with the internet. So that's, mm. been, that's been really nice. Mm. Those are some interesting points. I, I sort of bootstrapped a journaling practice a few years ago and like after, I don't know, like many years of like off and on and the way it, yeah, the way that I actually got it to stick was like to have as many journals as possible of as many oh, times because cool. like many physical ones of different places and like, you know, Twitter, multiple Twitter accounts, multiple Slack channels, Discord feeds, <laughs> like note private note places multiple private note places and different apps that have different features and it's like oh man it's like i don't know the more places i have to record things that like have different um trade-offs then the more likely i am to actually express myself yeah oh yeah yeah i like that i would feel at some point like i was losing track of things but Mm. that does make sense i mean i do i guess i currently journal in three-ish places so that's already that's that's never coming together. I'm never <laughs> going to put all of those together. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, I think it's probably a function of like mm, one having like like one of the things I worked on for many years was like productivity skills and like mm. really getting those down and and in particular like having a sense of what is useful to put where and mm. yeah the other one is just like being very online like it's almost like. It almost feels like rooms in my house where it's like, yeah, I, that's the room I go to for this kind of thing. Uh, and this is the room yeah. I go to for this kind of thing. And like, there's lots yeah. of rooms, <laughs> but yeah. uh, like, I, I don't have any trouble remembering where I put things, even if it would not work at all for someone else, you know? Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, cool. Maybe this is a good time to dive into the meta therapy stuff. Um, last yeah. time we talked, we got cut off right at, the point where I was asking you about there's a there's a section in the draft as you have it right now of called mm-hmm. concept buffet and I was going to have you sort of walk through those and explain your personal gloss on what these phrases are because you know these come from a number of different places uh, yeah. including Mark's meditation stuff but also other things and mm-hmm. I, yeah. I actually just tweeted about this today of like the people that invent the thing are not necessarily the best person to explain the thing yeah yeah <laughs> so um yeah, you had done global wayfinding last time, and we also talked quite a bit about focusing. So the third one in there is uh, confusion, which is an interesting one to have. Why confusion, and why is that third? Yeah, so I'm not sure that I would I would foreground it so much now. Um, I might still. I, so what I had in mind was like uh, when you start with like just very basic like naming feelings about things like there's you know there's uh this gets into the alexithemia stuff which is in uh section two anyway like people being out of touch with what they're feeling and needing to like sort of relearn like this was my experience i needed to just like learn how to name my feelings at all can you explain what that word means for people that might not oh yes so alexithemia refers to the condition of uh, I'm actually not sure if it's being unable to notice what you're feeling or being unable to name Speak. what you're feeling. Lex is like Speak. word. So. Lex is word, yeah. So being unable to name your feelings. So like mm-hmm. you're feeling, you know, a person might be feeling angry, but just totally unable to to like, to say, like, I feel angry. They're just like, I'm not angry for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that, oh, that is a classic example. I'm not, yeah. I'm not angry. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. So so Doug Tatarin, the, the biomotive guy, has this whole thing about what he calls cultural exothemia, which is like this sort of widespread pervasive um, inability to name one's feelings and how this is like a big, it's just, just sort of a major societal problem, which seems true in my experience. Like I, I have been around many people who had great amounts of difficulty naming their feelings, especially men, but really quite a lot of women also. Um, so that's like a whole thing. And then, you know, you can try to like, to over, to, 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 to improve on that by just practicing naming the feelings and like mm-hmm. doing 
things that look like gentle focusing or even simpler just like saying like i feel sad and mm. just checking so like, yeah does that feel true do i feel sad mm, no it's more like i feel nervous like uh yeah it feels a little that's a little closer like yeah i feel nervous. so you can you know you can like for me i i had to i i kind of like had to like rediscover the meaning of a bunch of these words that i had to really been using like i had i've been using them without actually feeling them like i had to rediscover like oh this is what sadness feels like i'm feeling sad right now and like this is what fear feels like i'm feeling fear right now and you know at some point along this process i got to something that was more like confusion than like anything else it was just like oh i don't un- there's this thing that happened to me and i don't understand it like i don't understand why it happened i don't understand how it happened I don't understand like what it meant that it happened, like, you know, some kind of maybe a traumatizing event or just some, it's just something. Do I have any good examples? Uh, so I think breakups, okay, are, are often a good example. Like someone breaks up with you and you just like don't understand why. You're mm. just like, what the fuck? Mm. Why? Mm. Why? Uh-huh. Like, oh, like this, <laughs> this, this kind of visceral feeling of like, there's, it's one thing to be confused in a sort of intellectual way, like, oh, I noticed this puzzle doesn't quite, right. do, there's this puzzle that I am that I'm, don't understand. And it's another thing that, to be like, yeah. why? Why? Yeah. Like this sort of guttural confusion. Like that's sort of what I mean when I mean confusion, which is this kind of existential, like I need to understand this thing and I don't. And mm. like, ugh, it's painful. And like, for me, I, I had a, I guess I like, I came to suspect at some point that like confusion was just sort of a much bigger deal in like therapy and meditation and emotional processing than people give it credit for. Like I rarely hear people talk about this except maybe Mark, I think Mark Mm. does talk about. It's huge in Zen. It's, it's Mm. like critical. It's like mission critical. In Zen. Zen. Oh, cool. I actually don't. Can you say more about that? Cause I don't think I'm familiar. Yeah. I mean, uh, they talk about it. I mean, first off I'm, I'm, I actually haven't practiced Zen. So uh-huh. I just like know about it and have encountered this territory in my own practice, which is not Zen practice. So yeah. uh, no worries. anyway, um, yeah, they talk about the great doubt or great desperation and mm. um, Mumon talks about it as like, um, he has this really vivid image of like, it's as if someone has like taken a molten iron ball and like shoved it in your throat and you can't spit it out and you can't swallow it. And it's uh. like, you have to just hold it and let it burn you. And, um, you know, actually, well, also the Christians talk about it. This always reminded me of, uh, I think it's Psalm 42 that talks about like, it's the, there's this beautiful, beautiful piece that I learned in college to sing uh, Siku Cervus by Palestrina. It's one of the most beautiful pieces of choir music ever. Oh. And well, at least in my opinion, <laughs> uh, I don't, not that I know tons of chorus music, but it's the most beautiful chorus piece I've ever sung, but nice. uh, it, it it's like the Palestrina setting is like so beautiful. And then that what's actually being described in my experience is like terrible. <laughs> it's like, uh, like a deer longs for water in, you know, that, so my soul longs for you, God. It's like, well, if you're actually thirsty, like that's, that's, a stressful experience, you know, (laughs) Uh, like, it's like, oh, you know, it's it's a beautiful piece, but um, anyway, yeah, so they talk about that, and I think that that kind of doubt or despair or desperation, this, like, primal confusion about something that really matters to you that you can't find an answer to anywhere that you need to answer, but you don't know how, is, Mm -hmm. I think, the real basis of koan practice and inquiry, where, like, you stumble into something that's, like, I need to know the answer to this. I can't find the answer. I, there's no one that can tell me the answer. There's no book. And I need to solve this a long time ago. And yet I have no idea how, and you're just yeah. sitting with that. And it's like literally burning in your chest and you're like, ah, you know, yeah. um, the times that I've touched on that in my own life and practice have been like both like some of the most terrible experiences I've ever gone through. And like the precursor to great transformation where it's like, if you, if you make it through that, it's good. (laughs) Yeah. 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 (laughs) Yeah. Thank you. Like that. Yeah. Thank you. That was, that was, that was clarifying for me to hear. How did you stumble into that? Like that belief yourself, if you hadn't seen references to it, that like confusion was extremely important. Uh, I think I, it might, it's probably something that I read from Mark, if I had to guess. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I don't remember, I don't remember what specifically, but it was probably something. I feel like Mark is very attuned to like the, the epistemic dimension of like meditative practice, like the ways in which you were, you're like acquiring beliefs and, and coming to acquire new beliefs and things like that. Uh, so I think it was probably something Mark wrote. And then also just kind of noticing my own confusion about my, things that have happened to me in my own life, like times that, uh, so I, I've mentioned in, in various places running into like a cult. In mm-hmm. Yeah, we talked about that and, last time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was, that was a very confusing experience. Like mm-hmm. I let, I came, I went through that experience. And it was just like, what happens here? Mm-hmm. Like what, what was going on? Like mm-hmm. what, what, what was meaning? that? How, how do I make sense of this? How do I like make meaning of this? And then, you know, it was cool to run into people on Twitter later who were like, explicitly using terms like sense making and meaning making i was like oh i need that mm-hmm, <laughs> that's mm-hmm. some shit i need i don't uh-huh. know how to do that anymore yeah. like i used to and now i've had experiences that were sort of like beyond my conceptual grasp um and that was a very confusing experience mm-hmm. um, i think the thing the thing you're the thing that hearing your description of the zen and the great doubt helped me clarify was like a I, the, like one way to say confusion in the sense I mean it is like existential crisis or something, mm. you know, when someone comes to realize, uh, so for example, I think many people in this community have had religious deconversion experiences where mm-hmm. it used to be mm-hmm. about Christians or Jews and then had some kind of crisis of like, wait, a crisis of faith, right? It's like, oh, I don't shit. Like I, I see this contradiction and I can't see it. And like, what is now what, <laughs> like, what mm. does this mean for me? You know, like how I has my God forsaken me and, and that I think is a is a is a great example of confusion. Just like what's what's going on? Mm-hmm. <laughs> is God real or not? Like what's mm-hmm. the deal? Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, maybe I will. I'm just going to add that to the document right now. Confusion slash existential crisis. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, mm. Yeah, cool, it's helpful. That makes sense. So then you put meaning. Yeah, a lot, a lot of these, a lot of these words are like, so some, some of these words, they seem to fall into two categories for me as a reader, half mm-hmm. of them are like, oh, this is a word that is a technical word that uh, I'm familiar with maybe from a specific domain or specific document or technique, uh, but like may, may or may not know myself. And then other ones are like um, very broad words. That's like, oh, I, yeah. I bet you have a technical meaning for this or a context, but like, uh, you know, meaning is thrown over around all the time yeah. so what what do you mean by meaning in this what context do i of mean by meaning so i yeah. i hope i hope I, I hope i'm not i hope i won't get too technical about it i have been thinking about it with respect to this document like i don't want the document to get too technical mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. ideally i would like it to be like poetic mm-hmm. like that would be that would be like yeah but in this case by technical i just mean like precise i, I don't mean precise okay. uh you know uh like a like a, a a manual for a how to install your microwave or how something. To install yeah. your microwave. Yeah. yeah. So meaning, for me, the like I I was I guess uh, turned on to the significance of meaning as a subject by David Chapman's writing with mm-hmm. uh, meaningness. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not sure how to describe what the shift there for me was but actually so I started reading David Chapman in the wake of this confusing cult experience that I had where it was just like what well just uh, just formlessly like what what the hell just happened and reading David helped me phrase that question a little differently into something like what meaning should I make of what happened Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. you know did this in the sense of like does this mean that I am bad does this mean that humans are bad does this mean that like you know, I came into, I was, I was drawn to this cult and to the experiences I had there because I had this kind of spiritual hunger. Um, there was not being satisfied in the rationality community. And so then I was like, does it mean that spiritual hunger is bad? Should I not Mm. try to satisfy my spiritual Mm. hunger? If it's just going to lead to these horrible, horrible experiences. Um, so the, I'm not sure how I would define meaning in this sense exactly, but something like the, like the way that one comes to understand the significance of events, maybe that's Mm -hmm. one story. Mm -hmm. And like, I guess I could also say sort of the stories that one tells about 
events, but specifically geared towards like the stories that tell you the, like the, the aspect of storytelling that has to do with significance. Like when you're telling, if you tell a story about a breakup where you're like, oh, she broke up with me because I suck uh-huh. <laughs> because I am a garbage person, uh-huh. which is a thing that I've the done. People, I've done pe- this. Yeah. People do that. No, I'm sorry. You've done that. And that's like, that's like a very specific meaning to make out of that situation. And, um, and one could, uh, one could ask like, ah, is there something better? Uh-huh, <laughs> is uh-huh, there a better thing uh-huh, that one could do? Uh-huh. Like one could, a, one could ask this question. And like, uh, I, actually, I guess in some sense, this sort of meaning making thread goes back a little further, maybe to the first time I did uh, LSD. Mm. And I noticed, one of the many things I noticed was that everything seemed more significant. Like mm. every thought I had seemed very significant. I was like, whoa, <laughs> this is the greatest thought anyone's ever, you know? <laughs> as one does uh-huh. sometimes totally and afterwards reflecting on that experience i was like wow like i that was maybe the first time i became aware of meaning making as something that i was doing mm. i was like wow there's like a meaning making process mm. in me that was that was changed mm. by this chemical uh, so that was maybe the very first time i was like oh yeah wow meaning making is like a thing and i'm doing it mm. and like i could do it differently maybe mm. like it could change that process itself could change uh, so that's sort of the, those are some, those are some of the associations that I have of, with meaning that are sort of relevant to, to this. And so to, to tie it back a little more, like, you know, there's, there's an important kind of therapeutic change that comes from changing the meanings one is making out of things that happens in the past. Like, oh, this thing doesn't mean that I'm fundamentally bad, or, oh, this thing doesn't mean that, like, all people are fundamentally bad. Like, oh, it's just, there's a, there's a kind of, like, letting things just sort of mean what they mean instead of needing to blow them up into these like big universal meanings, mm. which is related mm-hmm. to this, this stuff that David Chapman talks about with like eternalism where like uh, eternalism being this kind of desire for like fixed universal meanings that are sort of true for all time, as opposed to these the kinds of meanings that we actually have, which are sort of contextual and, and sensitive and like nuanced and like just sort of, they're just where they are and they're not, other places mm-hmm. i don't know if i'm explaining as well <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah i haven't i've haven't read his stuff but I, I think i'm tracking you so um yeah and your answer to that points out like you don't necessarily need to define each of these terms more just like yeah uh my ulterior motive here one is both to understand these things better but also maybe you know to help you like fill these out and and kind of yeah. riff on them so and whatever the yeah, associations are great yeah yeah thank you this is mm-hmm. helpful good um okay i'm gonna skip parts and energy uh yeah. let's go to coherence what what's what's coherence all about yeah so coherence has a really specific meaning mm-hmm. um, it's a thing i picked up from reading unlocking the emotional brain which is mm. partly about coherence therapy and in that context it refers to this idea that like uh, there are a couple of different ways to say it. So Chaos Prime tweeted once something like, the most revolutionary idea in psychology is that everything that people do is rational. And it's it's along those lines. It's this like coherence is like people, uh, it's a little, I could say it, people do things for reasons, but it, it, coherence involves things that people don't conceive of as actions. Like coherence in, can involve like hallucinations and like panic attacks and, like procrastination and like all these things that 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 a person might experience as being totally outside of their control. Like this is just this some crazy shit that's happening to me. And um, the coherence perspective is very much like this is something that your system, like your body mind, like your body and your mind, and this whole thing sort of working together in, in concert. This whole thing is generating this hallucination or this flashback or this etc. And it's generating it for some reason. There's like some coherent reason uh, that that's happening and one can come to understand that reason uh, through the therapeutic process and like and and that those kinds of understandings not like an intellectual understanding but like a lived experiential understanding uh, according to the coherence therapy is like uh, the key driver of real therapeutic change so like let's say to pick an example from my own life uh, I was procrastinating very heavily on uh, my PhD thesis for mm. years. And, you know, one perspective I could take on that is like, oh, I would love to work on my thesis if only somehow this, 
this procrastination, which this like alien entity, which is not me, but is somehow just, just attacking me. If only this procrastination weren't getting in the way. And the, uh, the sort of coherence of perspective on that is that like some part of me, let's say, is generating that procrastination for a reason. There's like some way in which, uh, this is a phrase in the, the, the theory, like, like there's some way in which it's necessary mm. to not work on my thesis. And there's probably several different things that were going on, but for me, I think the basic thing was that working on my thesis produced these pr- extremely powerful feelings of shame. Like mm. I was very ashamed of myself for how little I had done and for how hard it was and for the ways in which I felt like I was sort of, uh, I was like letting myself down. Like I had this dream, you know, I really wanted to be a mathematician and I was like not doing that. <laughs> mm. And those p- feelings were just, I did not understand how to confront those feelings. They were just intolerably painful. And, you know, once I became aware of that, I was like, ah, that makes sense. <laughs> That's mm. like, like, that makes sense as a thing. Like I, I came into contact with some of those feelings of shame. I was like, yeah, this is actually overwhelming. <laughs> this really mm. fucking sucks. This mm. is like terrible, mm. you know? And it's, coherence is such a, it's such a, what's the word? It's such a compassionate point of view, which I really appreciate about it. It's very like, it's sort of the opposite of this kind of like pathologizing point of view where you're like, oh yeah, people, some people have like mental diseases and their brains don't work right. And they just do stupid shit for no reason. And we just have to like medicate them out of it. And instead it's like, no man, that stuff is happening for a reason. It may not be a very palatable reason. It may be a reason that is difficult to articulate. It may be difficult to accept for cultural reasons, but it's still like our bodies are smarter than we are they're still doing stuff for reasons Uh, so that's one thing I like about it and I also like the way in which it sort of ascribes people quite a lot of agency like there's just which is another key part of coherence therapy is helping people recognize their agency and generating their own behavior instead of being like this procrastination is happening to me it's like I am doing it Mm. I am a part of me at least is choosing this Uh, so that's some those some things about coherence Mm what I, i've been curious about coherence therapy for some time and I, I don't know too much about it and what you say is helpful i'd be curious to ask you what you feel coherence therapy offers that other systems don't like it seems like it offers kind of some missing pieces that are important and like w- what was critical there from your perspective so I don't feel super well qualified to answer that question yet because I have not done very much of it yet. Um, mm-hmm. I'm currently uh, in this training where hopefully I'll get to learn a little more about it. And I have been, which has been, which has been nice. Um, I do think, so the, the book Unlocking the Emotional Brain does point out, so it, it sort of is both about coherence therapy and about sort of this broader kind of meta theory of how therapy of change works. Mm. And um it distinguishes between what it calls transformative approaches and what it calls counteractive approaches um, where transformative is so coherence therapy is one of these like you sort of actually get at the heart of why the procrastination or whatever is happening or the irrational hatred or just whatever whatever kind of horrible thing it is and you like completely satisfy whatever the the need, underlying need is such mm-hmm. that it just doesn't arise anymore And so there's no need to fight yourself because there's just no, there's nothing to fight. Whereas a counteractive approach might be like, oh, you know, you procrastinate a lot. Why don't you like set up some, some habits where you like make yourself work on the thing periodically or like schedule a co-working call with some friends, which I'm not saying those things are bad, but uh, the distinction there is that the procrastination itself remains as a thing that needs to be fought Hmm. and that, that one has to sort of spend energy and resources fighting. Uh, so, but the, but the reason I, so I say this in order to, to emphasize that even according to those guys, there are lots of transformative therapies, coherence therapy is not the only one. Mm. Um, they just, there's a whole list of them in the book, like internal family systems, for example, in their, in their book counts as a transformative therapy. Also um, EMDR, the, the rapid eye motion thing. And there's probably others, plenty mm-hmm. of others that I've forgotten. So CBT is not, they, I'm pretty sure <laughs> they count CBT as counteractive. Uh-huh. Uh, and I, had, I don't have an experience with CBT, but it, it does seem that way to me. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
right. sort of try, trying to fight yourself when you do CBT. I don't, right. I don't like that personally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, so in in theory, I think you could get many or maybe even all of the same of the benefits of coherence therapy from doing something like IFS instead. So it's not like I don't think it's like necessary. I don't think people like absolutely need to be doing coherence therapy specifically. Um, and also on the other hand, coherence therapy itself contains a lot of room for improvisation and a lot of room to like bring in techniques from other, from other uh, modalities, which is really cool. Like you can do IFS in a coherence therapy context if like a part comes up that's relevant to the process. Um, so that having been said, uh, one thing I like about the coherence therapy approach is let's contrast it to IFS. It like doesn't require a concept of part. Mm. Like some people really don't, really, really don't like conserve, conceiving of themselves as having parts. They really strongly feel or want to feel like a unified entity. And coherence therapy lets you respect that. Like you can just talk in terms of I statements. You can just be like, I feel this, I want this. Like I am choosing this. And mm. you never have to you never have to talk about a division into parts and coherence therapy if you mm. don't want to, which I think is helpful for some people. Mm. Uh, and also, I think some people will feel will be tremendously relieved by thinking of themselves in terms of parts. So mm. there's sort of you know different different strokes, kinds of things. There's also something I would like about coherence therapy, which is its emphasis on uh, like beliefs. I guess you could say. Like there's a lot of the, I mean, they call them schemas in coherence therapy, but there's lots of stuff in there about sort of deep seated beliefs that are driving a lot of behavior. Things like I'll never be lovable or things like everyone's out to get me or things like more, it's usually sort of, it's usually a little more elaborate than that. It's usually paired with some kind of response to some kind of situation. Like I'm, I'm not inherently lovable. Therefore I have to do all these things to impress people, to convince them to love me but it'll never really last because mm -hmm. you know, eventually they'll find out that I'm just inherently unlovable. Uh, so there's sort of, there's always sort of a pairing between like, here's a belief I have about the way things work. And then here's sort of how, sort of my, my automatic response to that state of affairs. Mm. And a lot of, a lot of the process is about essentially taking unconscious beliefs and making them conscious. Just being like, Oh yeah, here's this unconscious belief I have about the way I am or the way other people are or the way the world is that has been like driving a lot of my unconscious behavior. And like, now that I'm, now that I know that I can start bringing that behavior, start bringing that belief uh, further up into consciousness. And then it can like kind of start hanging out with my other beliefs. Mm -hmm. And incoherence therapy has a very specific uh, sort of framework for doing that second part, both mm -hmm. of those processes, both of like identifying the belief and then kind of like letting it gently arise into consciousness and then letting it find um, disconfirming evidence basically like oh am i inherently unlovable like mm. let's maybe there are some other experiences i've had where i have i have like felt inherently worthy of love and like those experiences can kind of start to talk with this experience of feeling inherently lovable and they can kind of integrate with each other and then good things can happen mm. that's really interesting because um you know one of the shared pieces of context that we have that we talked about before, but is, is biomotive and uh, in the way they typically present it, like as on an introductory level, it's like, oh, there's like your story and then there's the core, there's the emotions and then the interpersonal feelings. And then there's the, the core feelings. And those are like the nine that have the negative and the positive. And like, mm -hmm. there's, in my experience, there's like tremendous value in just like undoing the alexithymia of like naming what you're feeling. And that's like, yeah. that's relieving. That's like, mm. it feels good and you cry and you release. Yeah. But as far as I can tell, and they, they talk about this, they say below that actually there's feeling beliefs, but they don't, um, at least as what I've been exposed to from them, they don't exactly talk to like about how to find those or mm. reliably get to those. But like Doug is a master at like teasing those out. And then if you get to that point, like you update, you know, and that's where the really transformative stuff, it's not just a relief or like yeah. let release. Um, it's like, oh yeah, that's when it's actually transformative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So having infrastructure around like, I, I, I sort of reverse engineered for myself how to find feeling beliefs and yeah. process them with biomotive, mm -hmm. but having like a, a system that actually helps you do that, gives you infrastructure for that seems very powerful. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Currents therapy is very systematic about this. It's really cool. Excellent. I mean, that, that just points to the need. I mean, again, we talked about this before, but the need for this sort of thing is like the more dialogue there is between these things, uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah, better. Because yeah. biomotive is great. I'm and by no means criticizing mm -hmm. biomotive. I think it's like critical. Yeah, yeah. It was critical mm -hmm. for me anyway. Yeah, uh, yeah, for me too. For me too, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Um, the next one I want to ask you about is, and on this is redo to undo. How would you explain what that is? So I, I'll preface by saying, I don't think I've ever actually done it. <laughs> okay. So okay. this is like very theoretical, uh -huh. but um, I think there are some people who might need the concept very badly. So um, maybe the, the, the touchstone, the, maybe the most concrete touchstone for this sort of thing is like, so there's a section in, in the body keeps the score mm. where Bessel van der Kolk talks about this thing that people who've gone through really serious trauma will sometimes do well they'll try to reenact the trauma mm. like um you know maybe uh someone who was raped will try to like in some way reenact their experience through having sex with people subsequently like this is this is a tricky subject to talk about it's like it's, it's not people don't want to think about this sort of thing but i do <laughs> think there's something real there i do think there, there is a real sense in which uh, there is a kind of desire to go back to the traumatic experience to somehow like to, to somehow change something about it and Mark has these, so the, the term redo to undo comes from, comes from Mark's stuff. It comes from his meditation, meditation book talk page. And I, I can't claim to really understand it, but like mm -hmm. the thing that I understand so far from the, from the little I've read from Mark about it is like, um, is sort of a generalization of this trauma thing. Like sometimes you've been through some confusing experience. So this is related to confusion and in, in the meditative or therapeutic process, you want to in some way revisit that experience so that you can like, so something can change about it. So it's called redo to undo because it's like there's this thing happened to you and you want to kind of like undo the, 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 negative, the negative consequences to, of, this, of, of this experience and sort of the way you related to it. So you like somehow go back to it. And this could be, I think, as simple as just revisiting the memory. This could just be like, oh yeah, there was this thing that happened to me in a way like this. And like, I can, for example, I can make a new meaning out of it. So that's like one kind of thing that could happen. It's like, oh, at the time that I experienced this, you know, I, I took it to mean this thing. I took it to mean that like I was inherently worthless or I took it to mean that like people were inherently dangerous, all sorts of things. And then you can kind of go back, you know, as, as an adult with like new perspectives and new, like, new, new beliefs and new experiences and re-experience it, but differently and be like, oh, it, it didn't mean that. It just meant... Mm this was just a terrible thing that happens to me and like mm. i was a kid and like someone was supposed to protect me from this and they didn't um, so this also has to do with like uh with meaning and meaning making but i i think mark intends something even more general than that like i think there's even weirder stuff that for him falls under under redo to undo which mm. i don't under i don't claim to understand because again i don't think i've done this um other than occasionally i go back to memories you know and i try to like sort of re uh like recontextualize them or something like that but yeah i don't think i've done this very much but i do think there are there are a handful of people who i think have had like pretty specific pretty serious traumas who might need to do something like this in order to go back there because they might be there might it might be material that's like very rarely activated and so it's just like hard to find opportunities to mm -hmm. to to do it <laughs> to, to mm. go back but I really don't know. Uh, I don't know if I should keep this in there because it's it's kind of niche. But oh, I think it's I think it's very important. It's one of the biggest ideas I've taken away from Mark's mm -hmm. stuff from what I've digested of it. And um, yeah, maybe a couple points there that seem worth mentioning. One is, you know, you, you mentioned Bessel van der Kock and like trauma reenactment, and I just want to like surface a very different way of framing that which has been extremely useful to me, but it's very woo. It's like a very woo way of putting it. But uh -huh. um, which is like, yeah, it seems it seems like this is just a way of putting it. So yeah, discard this if it's too woo for you. But it seems to me that the if if you haven't worked through something, the universe will prevent present you with similar circumstances repeatedly at, at, at a kind of a higher um, volume of uh suffering basically until you <laughs> resolve it, you know. Uh, <laughs> Like I look, I mean, I look back at my own life um, and like things are repeating themselves. It's like, oh yeah, I've been through oh, this yeah. before. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and each, 
like the, you can you can kind of like fight that and just like keep refusing to learn the thing or you can like mm -hmm. ride the wave and like learn what you need to from it and yeah yeah um yeah you can kind of like be a victim of that process or like a, an active responder to that process and lean into it and i've certainly found it helpful to like lean into it with courage and equanimity basically um yeah 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 so that's one thing and um mm -hmm. the other thing is i just very recently i was thinking about this a ton with vibe camp because in particular mm. because it's like okay i i know for myself i had all kinds of like school trauma and like social dynamic mm. stuff of like mm -hmm. oh i'm mm. not cool and nobody likes me I, you yeah, know who do i sit with like at me. lunch they're gonna make fun of me yeah who do i sit with at lunch i'm just gonna avoid <laughs> yeah. people and, and and like i was looking around on the timeline before and i'm like i think people are having similar things that they're like are yeah. people gonna like me like i don't know yeah, are people yeah, gonna be yeah. mean you know and yeah. i was like oh, we're gonna read we're gonna collectively redo to undo high school middle school trauma yeah. <laughs> yeah, and like yeah, we did yeah, it yeah. like i think you know maybe there's some difficult experiences i can't speak for everyone mm -hmm. but it seems like overall very positive yeah. experience of like hey we're gonna gather in a social environment and like like each other yeah <laughs> like yeah, i know yeah, it yeah. sounds crazy <laughs> i know we're gonna eat some meals together in a cafeteria and have yeah, dance yeah. parties and like talk to each other i know i know it's scary but yeah uh, yeah that anyway. was something i was yeah it was something i was a little worried about going into vibe camp i was like is there gonna are there gonna be like clicks you know are they gonna be mm -hmm. like the cool kids and are they and I, i'm 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 i don't think that happens i think that I, as far as i could tell in, like that to, things were like pretty fine along that dimension and like i personally was like oh i could just kind of sit with every the people i know at lunch but like what if i just didn't do that so mm -hmm. i tried to sit with a different group of people every time and just mm -hmm. like introduce myself to people and talk to people and i think that went pre I'm, I'm pretty i'm pretty pleased with the results of that so like, yeah definitely some like what if high school was good though <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah. uh Anyway, I want to mention that since it's like a salient and timely experience. I mean, I, this this particular concept has definitely worked its way into my my own sense making on this sort of thing. So yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, body mind go. What does that body. word mean? Why would so, you shove the words so body this... and mind together when they're <laughs> clearly so separate? <laughs> so this is again, I, I th this is not Mark's coining, but I think I got this term also from Mark, and I just uh -huh. love it <laughs> because it's like ah oh, yeah, there is. You know, people talk about uh, people talk about disliking Cartesian dualism. They're like, "Oh, somehow Descartes made this weird error where he was like, yeah, the mind and the body are separate somehow." And I guess for me, the sorts of experiences that convinced me that that wasn't true was things like I would, you know, I would I would feel a feeling. You know, I would have some kind of somatic experience in my body. I would like express something, or I would like cry, and I kept noticing that emotional processing was changing the contents of my thoughts. Like I just mm. had different thoughts after yeah. I processed my feelings. Like if I, if I cried, I felt like mentally more expansive. I felt more creative. My thoughts were like more, uh, my thoughts like were wiser. They like, I, I felt like it was easier to, you know, this relates to kind of Alexander Technique expanded awareness stuff. I felt like it was easier to bring in larger contexts into my thinking and to just kind of incorporate a, a lot of different kinds of information into what I was thinking about. And I just, I was like, wow, yeah, I just find myself having better thoughts. And specifically, I, there was a funny period on Twitter where I kept noticing that every time I cried, my tweets got better. <laughs> mm, mm, uh -huh. Just like, yeah. And for, that's probably about a bunch of things, but at least part of it for me was about stuff like, oh yeah, there's like kinds of thoughts that I can't have if I'm so upset that I'm splinching away at a bunch of different kinds of feelings that those thoughts can generate. And if I can calm my whole system down and like let some grief out, then like those thoughts are safer to think now. Like I can just change the contents of my thoughts by doing stuff with my feelings in my body. And so that was the kind of thing that that convinced me personally. I was like, oh yeah, these are just not separate. This is just kind of one. This is all just like one integrated unified organism doing its thing. And um, like I the rationalists had kind of their own version of this separation, not exactly a body and mind separation, but like, you know, the rationalists were very big on like system one versus system two, where system one is like the intuitive and like fast and immediate kind of pro processing and system two is like the slow and deliberative and like explicit verbal thinking kind of processing. And something about that never really 
sat right with me. I was just like, I don't, what's going on here? Mm. Uh, like people would talk about having system one versus system. This is sort of a digression. People would talk about having like system one versus system two conflicts. They'd be like, oh, my system one wants to like sit on the couch and eat potato chips all day. Mm. But my system two wants to like go to the gym and be virtuous. And they just kept bothering me for a while. And eventually I was just like, I don't think system two can want anything. I don't think this makes any sense at all. I think people are using system one and system two to refer to something else where like system two is like, here are the, the desires I endorse <laughs> and mm. here are the other ones that I tell you to um, That's a, this, this, this is drifting a little from, from body mind, but I guess there's a general theme of just like people really like to reinvent different versions of Cartesian dualism, mm. I guess. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I just, so I just like the, that the word body mind is explicit. Like, nope, it's one thing. We, there's mm. just one thing that we are going to talk about. Mm. And we're, it could be even better. It could just be a somehow, there could be somehow a single word that doesn't even have this body and mind split. Like still the fact that there's a body and mind split in the word is like unsatisfying, but I am not aware of a word that does that. So this is the best that I got. Is a different way of getting at this like or besides creating word saying that like things that affect your body affect your mind and things that affect your mind affect your body yeah 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 for sure <clears throat> yeah and i guess even even earlier than like noticing that changes to my emotions change my thoughts it was just noticing at all that like uh even just learning for the first time that emotions had a somatic component, I think there was a point to which I did not know that. And that was a surprise. Like, oh, like I have a feeling in my body that corresponds to feeling sad or feeling afraid or feeling scared. Like that was already like, oh, like as opposed to like a more mental experience of an emotion where you're just right. like th thinking like thinking it's so narrative. scared thoughts or yeah. It's a, yeah, yeah. It makes me very curious how you feel at this point in your journey with this stuff about the triune brain model that Doug uses extensively. Uh, like, what do you think yeah. about that now? Yeah. So Doug talks about this like uh, cognitive mind, uh, kind of like, I, I forget the term exactly, the cognitive mind, basically emotional mind and kind of somatic mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've, I've gotten a lot out of that, out of that distinction. Me too. Uh, it's been helpful to be like, it's, it was helpful, I think, even just to distinguish emotional and somatic. Like, ah, oh, those are not literally the same. There's mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. stuff that the some there's some of the somatic stuff that feels way lower level and like uh, just really just like stuff that I gotta let my body do, like stuff related to my breathing or whatever. Um, and then meanwhile, the emotional stuff feels more like uh, I think for Doug, the emotional brain is very concerned with social things. So very much like ah, uh, like do people like me? Do people not like me? That sort of that sort of thing. And so that was helpful to me for a while. I think so more recently, um, I, I ran into some people, uh, so including River, the Wilderless, who Rivers, River seems to prefer a fourfold division into, um, I think. Oh, he had soul, yeah? Yeah, mind, body, heart, and soul. Mm. And that was very interesting. That was a, a kind of a new idea for me. But as he described it, I was like, oh, yeah, there is kind of like a different thing. Mm. Uh, and if I were to just it it would be something I, I don't think i can give a very good description so my you know there's like the, there's like thoughts there's like bodily sensations there's like emotions and then there's like the soul i guess is more concerned with like wanting and desiring and imagining and like envisioning and like dreaming and sort of like what is sort of the the like the deepest yearnings mm -hmm. inside of me like what are yeah. sort of my my like my like uh, my spiritual hungers, something mm -hmm. like that, and having that as a distinct thing is like another upgrade from like oh yeah, there I I do kind of buy that this is that that the soul level is like meaningfully distinct from the other levels, and River claimed moreover he's like not only is it distinct, it's in some sense the most important level because if you don't pay attention to soul stuff, then the rest of the stuff is like why are you doing it? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, like you can take care of your body all day, you can like process your feelings all day but like why are you doing it and when he when he described that he was like yeah soul is kind of like the the thing that binds everything else together and like gives actually gives everything else meaning it's like oh shit you, mm. might, you might have a point there mm. and I, it helped me reflect on the way in which like there has been a <clears throat> like a 
like a like a like a, a yearning that has for me been powering all this whole thing the whole time. There's mm-hmm. a reason that I've been like, I'm going to go have a bunch of feelings now, and they're going to be very unpleasant and uncomfortable, and I'm going to do it anyway because there's like some, I have some kind of like vision of like a place I could get if I yes, do this. Absolutely, and that's that's been kind of like in the background for a while. I guess I've been shy about it because it's it feels very vulnerable to mm-hmm. talk about. That, mm-hmm. to talk about like sort of like what is what is the what is the true yearning in my soul it's just like <laughs> totally. ah like you can't ah it's just <laughs> you have to, to be careful with that stuff uh-huh uh-huh yeah i i just want to um well one yeah i think i think it's i'm so glad that he adds that because that's definitely i think it was in the background for me for a long time and like he and others really helped me put that at the foreground and yeah. it's been very helpful for me and I yeah I think I would frame it like like I, I you know I, I'd be curious to see how he, he would frame it but for myself it's like your 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 character and personality and circumstances have a directionality that like your life is trying to go into and you can like fight that or you can run in that direction <laughs> and like the world as far as I can tell like the world needs that from you like you're mm. to me, it's like, this is just a way of seeing in Berbea's parlance, but a way of seeing for me is like everyone that's alive, that's on the planet has a gift that they have to give from being here during their time. And you don't actually have to give that gift. Like you might die not having given it, given it, but like, if you know that you can be like, yeah, I want to give my gift. And like, that will actually, it's also, it's, it's meaning I, I keep, I keep, I really want to like harp this so many times but i think i used to think that like being of service in the world was like a painful sacrifice basically mm-hmm. of like i the, what came to mind was like volunteering or something of like like associations that i had with that of like oh i'm like supposed to do this thing that's good but i'd actually rather do other things that i don't really want to and like it's yeah, not fun yeah. you know but like this thing this gift is like if you actually give it and you don't fight it is like the most joyful thing you could possibly do. Mm. It's oh. like, it's like not, it's not, it's not painful to say, what's painful is fighting it. It's like mm. excruciating to fight it. Um, mm. But if you go with it, it's like, whew, this is, this is, I'm living <laughs> the life right here. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'm glad he has that. And then, and I also wanna say separately, I've said this to both of you, but I want I wanna like go on record here saying this. I'm so glad the two of you are talking because um, I think, I think basically you two have had a discuss and similar things, but from different perspectives and like, mm. in particular, in different communities that I'm both in, yeah. like he and I are yeah. in a song together and we like, like the, the vibe there is like very different. And then you and I are in the Slack together that we've discussed before and like mm. the moods and gestalts and techniques and so on are very different but you two like consistently get at very specific points especially around like stories and narratives and myths Mm -hmm. and like how important that stuff is like oh there's this tendency Mm -hmm. to like i know for me i was like oh maybe i just shouldn't engage with fiction i'm just wasting my time like i have better things to do but it's like no that actually that's what guides your soul right yeah yeah, what stories resonate with me that that's the clue like go in this direction Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know so anyway i'm very happy you two are talking yeah it's great yeah I had a, I had a really lovely I scheduled a call with him and uh, Nancy, soul director, mm. and just to talk about imaginal stuff because I I met I met uh, Nancy at Vibe Camp like last day, and just had this really invigorating conversation about like stuff that I was really into when I was ten years old, you know, like it's like the Matrix and Gundams, mm. and, like Super Saiyans, and I'm like, wow, this is really <laughs> I really was into that. That was like a whole Heck like, yeah. important thing. Uh-huh. To me, to my, to my child self, and then I just kind of set all of it aside without really, uh, you know, with saying goodbye to it or anything. I just like, oh, okay, that period of my life is over. But that was a, just a really cool thing to get back in touch with, even a little bit. And then I was like, oh, and then he also mentioned that he, like, talks to River and like learned stuff about imaginal practice from River. So I set up a call with both of them. It was such a lovely call. Like, mm. We just talked about, just had so many, just like a lot of just talking about imaginal stuff and just like trading ideas back and forth. And we talked about this, River told me about this heart, uh, mind, body, soul thing. That's picked a different order of time. And it was so nice. And I think it was another example of this, of this thing that I've been feeling of like, we just need to be talking more. <laughs> it's totally. just like more, more exchange of ideas. Like 
I, yeah, I really like talking to River. I would love to talk to him more. I really like talking. I think I'd like talking to magicians generally, just people who have done a lot of like magical practices because they yeah. like have run into like some of the, they like care about some of the same stuff I care about, but the language is very different and the techniques are totally different. And like, just the perspective is like quite different. And I just, I just find it very like enriching. It feels like a, like a, just a useful, like, a, Oh, I just, I want to, I want to take this. I want to uh-huh. put I put this stuff inside of me like, totally yeah, it's exciting i'm glad you mentioned that in particular because i think that's like one of the key cultural differences between the two groups of, that i'm was mentioning it's like basically yeah, we talk quite a bit about like berbea and magic and time and myths and stories and imaginal practice in the other one and then uh yeah i don't always like feel at home talking about those things in the other group because basically it's like I'm not I'm not a rationalist and then there are lots of like rats and post rats in that group who I I love no problems with it but I'm like oh is this like safe to talk about here like I don't Uh, know I would love if you talked more about that stuff for Mm -hmm. for what it's worth I think it would be really I think it'd be a healthy I've been actually thinking about this like it would be like a healthy counterbalancing to the sort of the tendencies that the slack runs (laughs) totally totally Yeah. yeah I'll try to bring that appreciate the encouragement um cool um hmm concepts i concepts. imagine that there <laughs> that you have, have some things to say about that yeah that might not be... I, i'm wondering what i had uh, i have a guess about what i had in mind when i wrote this and probably i could phrase it in a more specifically helpful way because right now it's, it's mm-hmm. maximally vague uh-huh. um, but like there is so there's a there's a way that people have of talking about words and thoughts that is kind of very denigrating in spiritual circles of like, Oh, you know, uh-huh. you need to like get, yeah. see past words and thoughts uh-huh. you need to like get back to the direct experience and just be here now. Uh-huh. And like, that's a thing, like no doubt wordlessness is like a whole thing. And like learning to sort of see past one's stories is like a whole thing. But also as we've been talking about having stories is another whole thing. And I wish, I wish I knew more about Robert Bay. Maybe you can tell me more about this because he seems like he's really on this you know on this kind of like how would i say it like a lot of spiritual teachers will talk about deconstruction but very few will sort of seriously talk about reconstruction right like okay you've deconstructed everything congratulations now like, yes. we still have to like live in a society and like raise children like we still have to uh-huh. do that stuff so how are we going to do it you know like what sort of what what's sort of the backbone of all that and uh maybe i'll put concepts and stories in the same time. Hmm. so one of the things I, ha- I one of the things I have in mind with concepts is like there really is a difference between having an experience and then having an experience that you have words for, um, and it's a big difference. Like I, uh, I, I had a conversation with a woman a while ago who mentioned that when she grew up, she had not heard of the con- of the concept of consent. So mm. There's just no, she just did not have the concept of consent in in her conceptual vocabulary at all her in her conceptual toolbox and then you know she experienced some confusing situations around not feeling like she consented to various things but she didn't have any language for talking mm. about it, so she just couldn't talk about it to anyone and then she describes later coming across the concept of consent and being like oh, that's what we're, that's what that was like i i had needed language for that and i didn't have it like there's something there's something like if you've never had the experience of of having an experience that you literally didn't have concepts for it. It's like, uh, it, there are people who probably sort of st- stay inside the, the realm of things that they have words for. And if you've ever been outside, it's, it's weird and scary. You're like, what was that? I don't know what that was. Like, I have no words to describe it. And it's, you can still have the experience, but it's, it's a lonely place to be, to just be like, I don't know what that was. And I don't know how to talk about it. And I'm just going to sit here and feel like, I'm the only person who's ever had that experience in the entire history of humanity. That's like a, that's a terribly lonely place to be. And, and on the other hand, there is like a real relief in someone else being like, here is a concept and being like, Oh my God, that's relevant to my life. <laughs> like, uh, have, you, have you heard of epistemic injustice? No. I, that's, that's a concept that you should know about that describes yeah. this territory. And uh, cool. I discussed it with, my friend Kat Swatel uh, very early on in the podcast. That was, that was, there's a number of episodes in the podcast where like 
for whatever reason like are not like our, ours is like one of the most popular ones but like they're ones that are like not nearly as popular but I'm like these, these are very good and should be listened to and that's one that's a very good one and uh her talking about nice. epistemic injustice would be something you'd be interested in so just flag that um yeah i also mentioned for anyone you since you mentioned berbea that i also have my blog post on berbea which is kind of like a berbea intro so you might be interested in that nice. yeah cool I would like to, yeah. I'm thinking of, I, I'm going to try to get into Rebea a little bit. Yeah, I mean, so, so. once you go down that road, it's 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 good. So he's he's had <laughs> such a such a tremendous influence on me, and I, I know a lot of people nice. in the scene as well. So cool, um, yeah. Dope. Um, yeah, actually, it's interesting to 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 come into. Uh, uh, gosh, and there are a few concepts around this, but but certainly epistemic injustice of the next one is gaslighting which is a, yeah, it's like a classic a example thing. of epistemic injustice but mm. um yeah what, what would you like to share about I'd gaslighting like to say about gaslighting so so i so we've talked a little about meaning making and stories and sort of like making stories out of one's own life and guiding one's life through stories and there was a and i also mentioned having an experience with like a kind of cult and a kind of cult leader that was that was maybe the experience that most clarified the nature of gaslighting for me. So I I had kind of previously, I actually don't know how people use the term exactly. I had previously thought of gaslighting in this very simple, basic form. Like the, the caricature I had of it was that people would try to convince you that things happened, which didn't happen. Like they tried to convince you that your memories were unreliable. And that didn't seem like anything that I was vulnerable to. I was like, I'm extremely confident in my own memories. If someone tells me like, no, that's not how it happened. I'm like, nah, <laughs> like, you can't convince me of that. Um, but that's not what I experienced. What I experienced when, when I, if to the extent that I'll say that I was gaslit, like the thing mm -hmm. that happened was that this guy tried to get inside my meaning making and to sort of take it over and to, to sort of position himself as being the authority on what things meant. Uh, and in doing so kind of cut off my own ability to meaning make about my life and my and the things that happened to me. Uh, that I think is like a very powerful and like awful form of control to have over someone else if you can do this successfully like get inside their meeting making loop and be like i'm the authority on what things mean now uh it well, really needing to go into specifics what what exactly was that like like to the extent that you want to talk about it like what does that look like it's it's tricky to give the it's tricky to give the flavor of it so so here's an example like we were having a conversation at burning man and he, like, he, I, I told him about, you know, some conversation that I had with a woman who was there. And he was like, oh, you know how, you, oh, QC, you know how you have this pattern where you like keep trying to fit women into a box, into like a little box. You like, mm. you like trying to make them act a very specific way while also insisting that you're not doing that. And they hate it. <laughs> mm. You should know that about yourself, QC. And I was like, oh shit, is that true? Like, maybe I do that. I don't know. Uh -huh. like, uh, you know, it didn't seem entirely wrong. I like, you know, I could think of things I did in my life. I was like, oh, that's like kind of consistent with this thing that he's telling me. So I asked one of the women that he was talking about. I was like, hey, here's this thing that, that he thinks I'm doing to you. Do you think I'm doing that to you? And she was like, no, <laughs> uh -huh. was like, no, I don't uh -huh. feel that way at all. Um, huh. I was like, oh, but like in that moment, I had like, I had like, uh, I had decided that like he was more right than I was about my experience. Yeah, that like if he saw something that I was doing, I was like, oh well, he. It must be better. true. It yeah, must, it's, he probably knows better than I do. I mean, I can't see my own blind spots, so like yeah. probably this guy can see them though. And so that was a thing that I had while I was still caught in the field, so to speak, in like the reality distortion field. And then I had an experience later where I uh, was sort of the the bubble sort of burst. Uh, like it was Ayla actually who Ayla wrote on Facebook like a detailed description of the kinds of manipulation that this guy was doing. Oh, I should just name it, his name is Brent. Mm. Uh, the, the, the kinds of, of, of the kinds of manipulation that she that she witnessed Brent doing in our in our Burning Man camp. And reading that description like shifted something very dramatically inside me. It was like one of the most dramatic shifts I've ever experienced from reading something. Um, it felt like I could suddenly breathe again. Mm. Like I had, I had somehow been holding my breath for a very long time and somehow the air cleared and I could breathe. And I was like, 
what mm. what just happened like what was i just in like what have i been inside that i'm not inside anymore and it was like there was a kind of world that Brent drew me into like a world in, like the world is the way he saw it like the the world is the world as he made meaning out of things and like i had been sort of drawn into his way of meaning making and that just became the way that i made meaning out of things and not entirely but like in in many ways for a while and then suddenly kind of got snapped out of it all at once and was like the fuck is that mm. <laughs> I, was, I was really weird that like somebody else was just in control of me a little bit for a while like, that was mm. fucked up. Mm. Um, so that was uh that was and and then i had the thought I was like, is this, have I been gaslit? Is this what gaslighting actually is? Like, mm. that, that exp- <laughs> oh, uh-huh. like, oh, I see. Like, uh-huh. I think I can now fit a concept to this experience. Like, oh, I was gaslit. That's what gaslighting was. Uh, what was. What was meaningfully different for you about connecting that concept to that experience that wasn't alive for you before? Like, what was the sort of shift in meaning of the word for you when you connected it to your experience? Uh Yeah, it's like the thing I said, like, instead of being like, oh, that was like a weird experience. I don't know how to talk about that's only ever happens to me being like, oh, this is a word that I've heard. Uh Even just knowing that this is a word that I've heard, which means it's a word that it's something that's happens to other people. Mm. And like, I'm not Mm. alone in this experience. And there are resources I can draw on. There's other people's experiences I can go find out about. And like, I can learn from their, I can learn from them instead of being just like kind of feeling crazy on, on my own. Right. So yeah, it was just so like it was. It was less of like. Yeah, basically, it made sense of your experience in a way that wasn't yeah. there before, and sort of made it uh, normalized is a weird word for it, but it, a little bit like that, a little bit more like ah, this is a thing that happens to people, as opposed to like ah, this is like a weird unique. Yeah. Like God just with this cursed. guy under this specific circumstance. Yeah, the in... devil has chosen me to uh-huh. suffer in this way uniquely. <laughs> uh-huh. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I imagine that was a, a big relief. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was. And also, it was still very confusing. I was like, I had to really, you know, uh, I had I, I had to, to accept a lot of humility. You know, I was like, mm. oh, I guess I'm not too good for this. You uh-huh. know? Uh-huh. I'm not like too smart to fall for right, this. Right, right. Uh, so that was a, it was a humbling experience. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And what? the reason it's, oh, sorry, Please. just to say, the, the reason it's in this document is that, like, because I think meaning making is such an important part of the therapeutic process, like, it's part of that process, I think, for people who have experienced a lot of gaslighting, whether from partners or from bosses or from their parents or from or society leaders, or society at large, right? Society at large. So, like, at some point in the process of trying to, like, seriously meaning make about your own life, um, I think you do have to confront ways in which other people have tried to interfere with that process. You have to be like, ah, like society told me to believe these things. That wasn't true. My parents told me to believe these things. That wasn't true. Like my partners told me to believe these things. That wasn't true. And like that, that's for some people, that would be an extremely significant part of the process. Just like, fuck. Yeah. There mm. sure have been a lot of people who've tried to interfere with my meaning making. Mm. So totally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm glad you. I'm glad you answered that because I, I was curious. Yeah, I was like, well, yeah, why, why put it in here? So I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, mm, coercion is next. Um, what What do you mean by that? And and in particular, is that I imagine you I mean to some extent some self coercion as well. Yeah, yeah. So it feels like a very big topic. So I don't know mm-hmm. how to like talk about it in sort of a properly scoped way. Mm-hmm. But like. Uh, If it's helpful, I could give a very specific form of the question. Or yeah, more that, specific. Would be, that, that would be, that would be yeah. just like, ah, oh, of course, what if you, we could just talk about that only yeah. for hours. I think um, a trend in Mark's document and the Slack that you and I are in is to avoid forcing or forcey stuff. And mm-hmm. that's, I don't think that's unique to the document or the Slack, but maybe unique in the degree to which it's emphasized of like, yeah, we yeah. don't want to force stuff. We're not going to force stuff. If it's forcing, that's bad. Let's not do that. Um, why is that so important? And yeah, what does forcing look like? And why is that so important to avoid? So 
it's tricky here. I think I think I've I've come to uh, be a little less um, what's the word dogmatic about this. Like mm -hmm. I think I've relaxed a little around force, coercively, uh, non-coercive, uh, like non-coercively. Like just yeah. organically, you can be like ah, like uh, which which is a slightly is a sort of distinct topic from coercion. I think, mm -hmm. but. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let me. So, so, what are some things about coercion? Okay, so when when we're children, our parents have to force us to do a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. and some of that is just kind of necessary. You know, like you just kind of like you just kind of can't. This is part of why I've relaxed a little bit about. It. I'm like, ah, it's just kind of necessary sometimes. You just kind of have to force kids to do things sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, but probably not as often as people think. You know, like there's so much of like you know, forcing kids to go to school, forcing kids to go to sleep, forcing kids to go to, I don't know, eat at specific times, forcing kids mm -hmm. to take up like that. I don't know, my parents made me study Chinese. I could, this is, it, this feels, it's like kind of a petty example, but it is an example. Like my parents made me study Chinese. I didn't want to study Chinese. I wanted to study French uh -huh. because that was the language of love. <laughs> uh -huh. Very <laughs> really? cheesy. Yeah, I love that. But they didn't let me, I had to take Chinese and the Chinese teacher sucked. I hated her. And that was just uh -huh. such an unpleasant experience. And there's there's just so much like i guess this must affect some people more than others like i think some people get really like myself get really really worn down by just all of this like oh these adults are just constantly making me do things i don't want to do it this fucking sucks uh and some people seem to just be kind of okay with that like i don't really which i don't personally i i'm confused about this personally mm -hmm. um but yeah so there's there's this way in which we all experience quite a lot of coercion if we went to school at least like so the so your parents course you to do things your school courses you to do things and and we can get quite used to operating in this sort of like framework of continual coercion. And uh, I haven't given a definition of coercion here, but hopefully this parents and the school example sort of point roughly to like people making you do stuff you don't want to do. It mm -hmm. is, but if that's still vague because what does making mean, you know, like, um, but why do I think it's significant in this document? Um, I think when you make people when you coerce people into doing things, even just setting aside moral considerations, they become, they, like, they don't want to do it. They're reluctant. So like, they're not bringing their full, they're not bringing themselves into whatever it is you're trying to make them do. Like they're, they're less smart. They're less creative because they don't want to do it. Mm. Like you're just not getting, you're just not getting all of them. You're getting as much as you can course of them, mm. which is maybe very little. And um, meanwhile, like, you know, some people experience very extreme levels of coercion, like really abusive parents or maybe really abusive partners. And that can really like be very traumatizing to go through something like that. You can come to really, um, you can come to like really distrust your own thoughts, your own feelings, your beliefs. This is related to gaslighting also and to distrust your own desires. Like, oh, I, I am not allowed to want that because that's like the sort of thing that I used to be punished mm. for or whatever. Mm. And like the sort of the, what once was like a beautiful, bright, shiny human soul can become like folded in on itself and just like compacted and like made very small and afraid. And I think a lot of the, I think of, of the sort of um, the vision of like therapy kind of some things and some kinds of meditation is sort of like taking a person who is like this and sort of unfolding them and like, you know, finding all of the, of the ways in which they've like been folded in on themselves and like decided that they're not allowed to do things or not allowed to say things or not allowed to feel things or not allowed to want things and not allowed to think things and just kind of unfolding all of those those degrees of freedom in mm. in sort of like the full reign the full spectrum of like human possibility and uh that's that's just a beautiful pause yeah pause you there and say it was, it was very beautiful to watch your hands just now uh, <laughs> the way you express yourself with your hands is very cool. beautiful thank you Thank you. Yeah. Um, what were you going to say? Oh, and so which is to say to try to bring this a little bit back to coercion. I think doing doing some of this is going to require like at some point confronting ways in which you've been coerced by people mm. and just like ways in which like the effects that that has had. And um, and I think if you want to sort of move towards like sort of full, I, I struggle to describe this like so this kind of like full spectrum human living is kind of like bringing your whole being into uh, into something into into your life into your work into your relationships like 
uh, I think there's something really important about learning how to do all of that stuff non coercively so, mm. because I think it's only when people do things truly willingly, like with mm. their whole beings that you like get the most of them. Like, oh, this is mm -hmm. like, we're all in on this. Like we are, we want this. We're going to do this together. We're going to like, mm. I'm not explaining this very well, <laughs> but I hope. Like, no, you are. And just... I think I'm, I got like a really vivid image as you're describing that of like the alternate universe where little QC studied French and like the, the way oh. your voice described Chinese versus French. It was like Chinese. Yeah, you could tell it was like this, yeah. like, no, I don't like this. And then the way you were like, <laughs> even just for a second, like, oh, French, you know, the language of love, yeah. like you could yeah. just imagine you like going in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I do want to say also like, you know, there's, there's, there's been this kind of funny thing on Twitter where like a bunch of people got really into talking about non coercion like, yeah, non coercion is like fucking great. And then I think there was some, there's been some like pushback against it. Like, well, mm. is it though? Like, mm. and so I do, you know, there are, there's a way in which like people can kind of like take non coercion to be like, I should never force myself to do anything. And I'm just going to like sit around and neglect all of my responsibilities and relationships. And it's like, well, maybe not that either though. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah. And it's it's difficult. It's difficult, right? Like, so that gets into into self coercion stuff. Like, I also think that a lot of that that there's like a big whole thing in the therapeutic process around learning how to relate non coercively to oneself. And it's difficult because if you sort of got used to using coercion as like a fuel source of like I'm just going to force myself to do things, and that's how I'm going to like get things done in my life, then you can kind of find yourself in a life situation where like if you attempt to switch fuel sources you, it everything might get quite a bit worse for a while mm. and this mm. is something that mark talks about a lot you know he talks about i um, mean he uses non -mono, this word non-monotonicity which is maybe not the best word but it's just a little long but he's very clear it's like yeah if you are really serious about this your life might get much worse for <laughs> pretty long periods of time and this i think is a pretty good example of like if trying to switch from coercive motivation to non-coercive motivation. It's like really a quite hard thing to do. And temporarily it might involve neglecting a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You might have to just be depressed for several years, which I think I basically did. You know? mm. So I, I know what I'm talking about. So it's kind of, it's not like you, I spent a lot of time just like not trying, you know, really trying to like relate to myself non-coercively. And that involved doing nothing for like long periods of time. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. It was a gamble. I like took a gamble on that paying off in the long term, which I think it has. But mm. I did have to spend a lot of time doing nothing. Mm. <laughs> and by doing nothing, I mean like playing video games and stuff. But, uh -huh. Yeah. I mean neglecting my responsibilities and my relationships. Right. Yeah. I feel like another really important idea with that, or, or sort of consequence of that idea of things being non monotonic is like, I, I think I keep finding myself wishing when there's like a shift in my practice or my experience of like, oh, I'm going to permanently have this be easier and like this will always be good now. But for me, it's been very much an experience of like four steps forward, one step backwards, two steps yeah. forwards, three steps backwards, you know, like, yeah, yeah, like yeah, the yeah. same themes recur, but they get easier every time, redo to undo. Like, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I've been going, there's like this like pretty consistent theme recently for me that I've been like working with month after month. And it's like, I've seen this before met for many years and it's like oh it's much easier this time and it's still mm. hard you know yeah 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 <laughs> so, yeah I do be like that yeah yeah mm. um what about uh so you have desires there but i think i think you get a sense of that how, how about strategies what's important about strategies in the context of therapy strategies yeah what did i work? have in, what did i have in mind when i wrote this i'm going to change some of this later probably mm -hmm. <laughs> but um What did I have in mind when I meant strategies? So maybe the simplest example is stuff like social strategies, mm -hmm. like people who sort of go through life and they want to like have nice interactions with people and they settle on specific ways of doing that. They're like, oh, my social strategy will be that I am very charming. Uh, I'll just like smile a lot and like act really happy. And like, that's how I'll get people. To, that's like my strategy for getting people to like me, which is my strategy for like making my social life good. Or like, oh, I'll be like very sexy. I'll like really, really play up my sex appeal. I'll like, you know, wear very nice clothes all the time. I'll like really do my makeup really good. And I'll like be just very, very like sultry and flirtatious all the time. That's like another 
strategy that one could have. Uh, I don't quite know what I had in mind by putting this here. And again, I might just get rid of it, but like there are, there are unconscious strategies too. There are people can be doing this kind of stuff without quite realizing that they're doing it. And then there's some progress that could happen from just recognizing like, oh, this is like a strategy that I run when mm. I'm like, uh, like a, this is like a defense mechanism that I have or whatever, like, ah, like I can, I can notice that, uh, that this is a thing that I'm doing on purpose for a specific reason. And that, you know, it occurs in specific situations, it, like it's triggered by specific things. So like, uh, yeah, I guess we talked a little about addictions earlier. There's also a whole range of, of kind of strategies around that. God, a nice strategy for dealing with these feelings will be to use alcohol or to mm. use weed or to use the internet or et cetera. And like that will be sort of the way that I deal with these with these things. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, also related to, to the sort of coherence therapy point of view of like, ah, yes, there are all these things that you do and maybe you really don't like them, do them, but they're happening for a reason. Like these things that you keep doing, there's some coherence reason behind them so that's and there's also sort of uh layered on top of beliefs which is the next point but to, like at, at least in my experience like the plans are or strategy yeah because I, I came across this through through like leverage when i did a training mm -hmm. with them and work with them and like um for, yeah it's like if you believe a certain thing and have certain goals then certain strategies make sense. But if the desire or the beliefs around that thing change, then the strategies sort of disappear or evolve or adapt or update because uh, the underlying beliefs or desires have changed. And Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna skip that and attachment and trauma. And I think the last three are more in this category of like things that might be somewhat unique to this. So weaponizing, what, what is that and why include it so uh weaponizing is kind of this general like people people will point out specific instances of this like i, I can't think of any good recent examples um but like they'll, they'll they'll talk about some specific thing like I don't know feminism and they'll talk about like weaponized feminism it's like mm. use feminism as a as a bludgeon to attack someone with, and it, and for me I think the the general dynamic of weaponizing just in general is like very rich actually and the the, the in this context what I have in mind is this thing I've observed where like uh like your defense mechanisms know everything that you know <laughs> mm, and like mm. any any anything that your defense mechanism anything that you learn whatsoever can potentially like become a weapon that a defense mechanism uses to defend something mm. like uh, there are I, I can't think of any specific stories like this but there are there are stories like you know people who like use psychological concepts to abuse their partners like to effect to like to gaslight them and things like that like mm -hmm. it's just people people will just use what they have and with what mm -hmm. they have is like an extensive theoretical knowledge of psychology they will use it under stress uh possibly subconsciously uh, like not there's sort of there's there's sort of nothing that's so pure that it's not capable of being weaponized mm -hmm. in this way which is sort of which is scary but i think it's it's worth acknowledging that this is that this is like a thing that happens mm -hmm. and like you know people talk about for example uh spiritual bypassing like there are lots of ways that spiritual concepts can get weaponized to like do all sorts of stuff to like attack yourself to attack other people like just all sorts of all sorts of things like that and uh, yeah I, th I thought it could be helpful to just like to promote that as like a first order concept like just the concept of weaponizing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are there any do you know any times that you've seen that happen in your own mind my own that you're willing to talk about mind so the closest thing i can think of is you know so it's related to this coherence and uh non-coercion stuff like i think there was there was a funny way that i was holding those concepts last like as recently as last year where i was like ah like I shouldn't force myself to do things and also everything i'm doing is for a good reason and uh there was a weird way that that actually kind of uh entrenched my depression it's just like mm. ah i'm depressed that must be for a good reason i'm going to keep being depressed because i wouldn't want to i wouldn't want to force myself to stop mm. being depressed um 
but after I, I got out of it a little bit, like I looked back at that sort of train of thought and I was like, huh, there's something a little screwy about that because the, the thing that I hadn't, that I was like kind of deliberately not noticing was that if I had made a choice to be different, then that choice would also have been coherent. Like mm, there was something mm. I was not understanding about my own agency that like I in fact had the agency to change if I should like, I just, I, I posted a tweet about this, which I was like, I, I think it was like, I'm, I'm experimenting with, I'm trying to see if I can just decide to be the sort of person who would just decide to change. <laughs> in December, and I posted this in December and I actually think it worked. That's the funny thing. I think it just worked. Um, I think at some point, like I just decided to be capable of making decisions about this sort of mm. thing. And then I kind mm. on some level, I like decided to not be depressed anymore. Mm. Um, and it, it happened indirectly. Like it didn't happen all at once, but I think like in, in a sort of intention setting way, like that basically happened. Mm. Um, I, on some level, I decided to stop being depressed mm -hmm. and, and yeah, so it was, just, it was, it was funny to observe the way in which I had been kind of weaponizing both coherence and non-coercion as concepts in order to keep myself in this depressive state. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Um, counter will. Counter will. Yeah. So this is a term from Gabor Mate. I don't actually know, don't know how to pronounce that name. Um, from his book, Scattered Minds, which actually I have not read all the way through, but he describes this as a symptom of ADHD in particular, of this, this kind of way that a, that a person with ADHD will sort of uh, reflexively rebel against things, like if, which is also related to this non-coercion stuff. Like, you know, if a teacher is like, you should do your homework, like, no, no, I won't go away. Or like, you know, if uh, even, even, now I'll notice things like if someone, let's say I'm in an online course, you know, that, that I willingly signed up for that part's like, I, I, I consented to being in an online course. And even then, if like someone, if like a, if like, you know, the instructor like tells me to do something, sometimes I'm like, you can't tell me what to do. <laughs> You're not my dad. <laughs> so counter will is that kind of like reflexive, uh, reflexive resistance to other people's will. And uh, Gabor Mate describes this as like, partly coming out of a, I don't remember the words ex exactly that he used, but something like a, like a lack of, uh, a lack of like one's sense of like one's own will or like one's own identity. Um, and he describes sort of a way that one could, one could be like grounded in a sense of one's own will and one's own identity such that like, there's no longer any need to just reflexively resist other people's wills all the time. Uh, so that's a thing. I'm not actually sure why I included it here, but that it's an interesting concept and I was struck by it. So it seems related to coercion at the very least. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, it does. It makes me, as you were describing that, I was remembering something I've been chewing on for a while, which is, that'd be interesting to hear your perspective on, which is last fall I did this you know, like an engagement tweet of sorts where I was like, hey, reply to this if you're, I limited it to people I followed and uh, was like, hey, if you want a project assignment, I'll give it to yeah. you, which mm -hmm. I, I probably wouldn't use that word again in retrospect, because uh, mm -hmm. I think that sort of brought up this like school trauma, like type yeah. stuff. Yeah, um, oh, it's terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But like, I think, um, yeah, I came up with like, based on what I knew about the person and like research if need be, I like, came up with something that I thought they would enjoy doing that would like push their challenge level a bit and also be good for the world. Like that was the goal, like enjoyable, challenging, but not too hard and beneficial. Um, mm -hmm. And like, I don't know what the completion rates exactly were, but like, I don't know, like 30 yeah. or 40%, which is good. But this then pretty also, good. I, I did not do mine. I remember yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, although you kind of did because you ended up making a sub stack. So good work. Okay, well, there we go. There yeah, we go. just many moons later. But um, many moons. yeah, um, I mean, there was no, I mean, I said that specifically, like there's no deadline. You don't have to do it. You can yeah. change it, you know, whatever. Um, but um, I would, if I did something like that again, I would be interested in setting it up in such a way that like counter will didn't arise if that makes sense yeah yeah i mean it, it, it's so tricky right like i i feel i think it, i think this has gotten better for me personally in just the last few months and even then there's still like uh it's still 
I still have some kind of a tricky relationship with like other people assigning me things to do just at all. And then like with dealing with, you know, it, it just brings up a lot of like, oh, now there's time pressure and like, oh, what will I do if I don't, you know, if I don't get it done in time, what if it's late, you know, like what if I have to do it and it's not very good because I ran out of time? Like what if I'm deliberately procrastinating on it so that I get into it? Like this is a thing I've heard a couple of people talk about too, like deliberately procrastinate on the thing so that I don't have that much time to do it so that I stop, I, I, I don't like, excess like spend too much time like prematurely optimizing it and just kind of like make a bunch of decisions that are good enough uh, so there's like a whole I, it's complicated it's like a whole mm -hmm. complicated like i'm still i'm still struggling with this whole relationship to like a time pressure and i'm like ah, oh, there's there's school stuff here i bet there's school stuff here i don't uh, uh -huh. yeah mm, do you have a sense of like a way that i could set something like that up in the future that would set you up for success in particular if like as, as sort of like a model example of someone that might benefit from this but find it difficult so one thought this is not directly an answer to your question it's just the thought that i have uh, one thought is that like it's almost kind of worse if it doesn't have a deadline because like then it can kind of be this indefinitely open loop and like at least if there's a deadline at some point the loop closes one way or the other um like i think i just kind of i mean i at some point i was just like i'm just not going to be able to get around to this so i like made a decision to drop it like i mm -hmm. i had that tweet bookmarked and then i took it out of my bookmarks and i stopped thinking about it uh, but there is something which maybe i should add into here there's like i think a lot of the like adhd types around these parts like one of the challenges in their life is just having a lot of open loops generally in their lives or at least i would guess so uh based on things people talk about like how many tabs they have open all the time and stuff like that and so it's tricky to 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 take a person who already has like a bunch of is already kind of like struggling under the weight of a bunch of open loops and be like here's another one <laughs> here's another open loop mm -hmm. um, and so what would I, so what, what does that imply? So one thought I have given that thought is like, it comes back a little to this soul wanting desire kind of thing. Like there has to be kind of like strong enough motivation towards the task to like, for it to be prioritized among the many open loops. And like, mm -hmm. I don't know what, I don't know what that would look like, but some kind of like, this is much more work on your part than responding to a tweet. But for example, if you could, if you wanted to like, hypothetically, just an example of the sort of thing that might work doing like a short call with someone mm -hmm. where you try to like get some sense of like what they feel really, really driven to do sort of like on a soul level and just trying to find a project that like so speaks to that, that it like, that it's able to overcome sort of the, all of the, the various obstacles to getting things done. Totally. Yeah, I was thinking of something similar insofar as well, if I and now at the time I did it, I, ha, I was following about 500 people, and I, I'm sort of an expansionary period right now of following. So I'm like at almost at like 900, I think. And so that means, as a consequence, I couldn't do the same thing again. And so I was thinking of having, I mean, we'll see what I end up doing, but I was thinking of having like a submission form. And then, yeah, like where I would select people and then I would do calls with the people that I selected. And it'd be, it'd yeah, be like a pool yeah. of like 10 people that I was like, yeah, I think these people are really going to benefit from this in a good way. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I've also been thinking of having, I mean, I don't know, of having like basically a fee for the service of some kind of like, yeah. not even because I need it, I don't need it, but like mm -hmm. just monetary incentive of buying into something is like, right. yeah, I'm, I'm going to do this. I like paid for this. And yeah. Yeah. There's also, a, so, so I, I'm in this thing that Sasha put together that he called mm. make something scary. That was just mm, like, yeah. we're going to get a group of people together and we're all going to like make something scary that we, it's mostly writing, but mm -hmm. That was your Substack format. post what you made? Yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. Congrats, yeah, yeah. brother. So that format I really like because then there's this sort of like, oh, we're all in this together. Mm. We're like all struggling together to do this thing that we want to do. Like that, I think is a really rich format. Just like having other people around and not feeling like, oh, I'm just by myself alone working on this hard thing. <laughs> totally. 
totally even even i think even if he like he's he's also been doing like group calls and individual calls which i think is wonderful but i think even if all he had done was provide like a discord be like hey you guys can hang out here like that would already have been pretty good just to be like oh yeah let's talk about our our struggles with our with this stuff and like specifically i think if i were going to run something like this i would be laser focused on like okay so on the one hand there's this project that you feel really excited about and on the other hand there's probably some feelings coming up when you consider working on it. Mm, let's totally. Name, let's name those feelings. You know, maybe we'll get into some into some rich emotional material mm. about like, oh, I can't work on this because it would be a disappointment to my father or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, like awesome. that's really the missing. P- I mean, I've been so immersed in productivity stuff for a long time, and I, I, I don't know. It was kind of like fashionable for a little bit to diss on productivity stuff. I found it very helpful. Person, I could not do the things I'm doing now without mm-hmm. that infrastructure. Um, and I think one of the, this is like probably the biggest missing piece of most productivity stuff I've seen. I think Malcolm's yeah. stuff is a big exception, but like yeah. you need to process it, whatever yeah. comes up before it makes sense to have a to-do list or notes yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Sure. That's really helpful. I think I'll fit some of that in if and when I do a similar thing again. So thank you cool. for yeah. reflecting on and that you, with me. You can also, once this, I think the program is over in a couple of weeks. You can like ask Sasha about his experience running it. Mm, that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, all right. So last one on this list is range of motion. What uh, do you mean by that? And yeah, what's happening there? Oh, there's two more. I don't know if you're looking at the, the most updated version. There's range of oh. motion and then there's double binds. Oh, great. Oh, it's bo- it's bolded. That's why. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, let's go through those then. Yeah, so range of motion, I kind of already talked about when I was doing the hand thing, just like mm. there are sort of so many different directions along which like a person can, that's a confusing thing, like in the same way that one has a physical range of motion, like there's all these directions that my muscles can move and like my joints can articulate themselves, like, and one can like go from having, you know, very sort of specific rigid patterns of motion to like learning how to like fully like fully take advantage of one's physical range of motion just mm. as a body. Uh, that's sort of a, that is both an example and a metaphor for the thing um, mm-hmm. where the thing is like, similarly one has sort of mental range as a mental, you have a mental range of motion. There's like a range of thoughts that you think there's yourself like an emotional range of motion. There's like a range of feelings that you feel you have like a, perhaps an imaginal range of motion, like a range of things that you want or desire or hunger or yearn for. And like, I see that, like I mentioned, a lot of the, the therapeutic and meditative stuff as one of one of the like big, uh, I don't want to say goals, like guiding, guiding lights is, I think for me, this vision of like expanding one's range of motion to sort of like the full, the full human experience, just like getting to feel all the things a human can feel and like move in all the ways that humans can move and like getting to want all the things that humans can want and just mm. like getting getting all of this just all of it just all of it <laughs> the whole mm-hmm. thing <laughs> maybe mm. not even all of it just like more you know just like maybe maybe you start out feeling very restricted along some dimensions like oh there's all these things i don't know how to feel or there's literally all these ways i don't know how to move my body and then just like the getting to experience the freedom of like oh, okay i can move in this way i can feel in this way this is like part of my birthright as a human being to be mm-hmm. able to do this like that's a, that's something that, that I, that, uh, that is important to me. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, and double binds, what are those? Double binds. Yeah. So this is a concept from, I don't remember who it's from, but I was introduced to it by Malcolm, I want to say. And the simplest, just, I guess the simplest thing is it's like when a person is, uh, like when a person makes two contradictory demands of you. Uh, and I think usually usually people discuss this in a family context, like you're growing up and your parents, I don't actually don't know what a good example of this is off the top of my head, but like, uh, okay, so this, is a, this isn't exactly a parenting example, but like in relationships, for example, you might experience a double bind where uh, someone is both demanding that you be completely honest and also react in a very specific way. Like, 
so like maybe maybe for example they're explicitly with their words saying like i want you to be totally honest with me but kind of implicitly with their vibes they're saying like also i need you to behave in this very specific way and if you don't i will get really mad at you mm. and you're just like mm. how what? do i yeah <laughs> how do i yeah. navigate this yeah. like you're i and it's 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 literally crazy making like i think some of the the original theorists were like this these are the sorts of things that cause schizophrenia wow <laughs> with, Wow. Uh, because because you're in this terrible situation where like you literally can't please this person like literally whatever you do you're you're violating one of the demands they're placing on mm -hmm. you like it's just logically impossible in some sense to that reminds me of like every, basically every time i have to interact with bureaucracy and fill out forms mm -hmm. for the government it feels like i will be in some way forced to unintentionally not every time but like many times i will be forced to violate my own value of mm. not lying uh, mm. and like it's like okay you have to fill out you have to fill out this form and yeah you know anyway i'm just reminded of that for sure yeah yeah so this is another this is an example a good example i think of like if you don't have the concept and you have the experience it's like extremely confusing and you're like mm. what is going on like i feel mm. There'll totally. be patterns of like, oh, I feel so uncomfortable when I talk to this person, but I don't understand why. And then someone will like give you this concept of like, oh, it's because they're demanding contradictory things of me. That's yes. that explains it. Yes. And uh, and like there's there's sort of there's sort of uh, I think there's there's like way more. I don't, I actually don't know very much about this. Like mm. the, Malcolm quotes this book by I think R. D. Lane mm. uh, that goes into this sort of thing in a lot more detail. Uh, are there internal double binds? Yeah, probably. <laughs> probably. Uh -huh. is like, it, that's something, I, a trend I'm noticing here is it seems like there's, yeah, it seems like, I mean, in my mind went to government, it seems like there's like internal levels, interpersonal levels, and then societal levels of each of yeah. these things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would say so. Mm -hmm. Like when I, the, like the example I described could also be like, you could have, you could try to be like forcing yourself forcing yourself to be completely honest with yourself and also to behave in a very specific way mm. or to feel it feel a very specific way mm -hmm. um, so that's that's certainly a kind of thing that could mm -hmm. happen yeah i think so mm -hmm. mm. cool okay i think there's one more thing i'd like to talk about um which is you know we talked about earlier about meta and the reason i want to talk about that of course i'm yeah i am myself interested in meta but i think the reason i want to ask you is like actually in the context of this conversation of a while ago you tweeted about um oh hey like what are all the therapy modalities that people use and like here's the list that i have of the ones that have been especially useful for me and for me it was like huh interesting um meta is not on that that's been incredibly important for me, but is it a self-therapy technique? I don't quite know. And like, mm -hmm. how does that relate to this stuff? And like, is it a thing that should be included? Are there reservations that you might have about being included? I know we've talked before about like difficulties you've had. seems mm -hmm. like that maybe there's been some shifts recently, which I'd be curious to hear about, but like, yeah. I don't actually know the answers to a lot of those questions. Like, is it self-therapy? What are the benefits? What are the risks? What's your experience been? And I'd be, I'd be very interested to talk about that in this context yeah 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 so i think i've warmed up to it a bit as you've seen uh from some of my recent tweets um can you say what so, you're alluding to because I, I know but just for folks that might not know oh yeah so i i have been writing some like kind of joke tweets about like uh like uh I mean, i'll just summarize it as like times when i have spontaneously wanted to wish someone well in some way right um and just noticing like oh i like really want this person to have like this good thing and and then being like is that meta it's like oh i guess i guess that is meta that's kind of yeah. nice and so so I've, I've i've enjoyed taking the opportunity to notice those things um so i've also tweeted a bit about this general and this i think is somewhat specific to me i think other people for example you or nick camarada don't feel this way but i i have had a general aversion to deliberately cultivating positive states mm -hmm. Uh, so not just meta, but just any kind of any kind of deliberate like, and uh, so I mentioned on Twitter that like ah, I think this comes out of having felt like I've been like coerced into pretending I was happier than I was for in a mm. lot of ways in my childhood. Uh, so again, this is like somewhat specific to me in my history. Although I assume I imagine this is a common. Experience oh yeah, I mean I think the specifics might be unique to you, but not not yeah. the general shape of the thing. Yeah. So like the kinds of practice that I have felt drawn to have been more about like uh, what's already there what am I already feeling 
um, that hasn't had a chance to express itself because I've just been so like keeping it all in for so long. And so that uh, like basically all of my, all, all of my like sort of favorite things that I've personally done have been along those lines. Just like, what am I already experiencing? What's already there? And it's actually, it's just, it's generally just a very new thing for me to like, even to just consider in any way, the question of like, okay, what would I like to create next? Like that just generally is a very new question to me. And, uh, and meta, meta, meta strikes me as an example of this thing, like, of like, oh, I'm going to like deliberately cultivate like feelings of, of loving kindness towards other people mm -hmm. in the same way that like, I might, uh, you know, I might put on music, for example, to deliberately cultivate a particular mood that I associate with that music, mm -hmm. or in the same way that I might. Um, so this is relevant to, to me writing a subset in the same way that I might make a work of art in order to cultivate a, a experience in other people and also in myself, probably, probably, or in the same way that I might tell a story in order to deliberately cultivate a certain, like, a certain experience in myself or other people. So like, there does seem to me to be this very rich area of like deliberate cultivation and I am very new to it. Um, so like, I don't, like, I don't quite know what to say about it yet. I guess like, it's just, it's just this new area, all, all of that, that whole gestalt is just still very new to me. Um, so for example, on a related thing is I'm in, in the men's group that I'm in right now, we're currently talking about uh, cultivating an identity and cultivating a mm -hmm. vision, which mm -hmm. is very related to this like imaginal stuff that we've been mm -hmm. talking about. So and that's been, yeah, it's very new to me. I'm like, oh, writing down a vision and an identity, that's scary. I've never mm -hmm. done this before. Like what's mm -hmm. up with that? Um, and so, yeah, it all, it, it strike, basically it strikes me as generally a, di a direction that I've been missing, like a dimension that I've been kind of not taking into consideration. Um, and maybe for good reasons, like maybe I just really needed to focus for a long time on like what's already happening, what's already here. And, and now I'm like sort of ready to step into like, okay, what would I like to happen next? Mm. What would I like to, to create for myself and for others in the future? Mm. Uh, so it does seem like Meta could fit, does fit into in that direction, in that direction mm -hmm. of like deliberate cultivation. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it seems good. And I mm. still just feel very inexperienced. Mm -hmm. I guess is how I am currently relating to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes me think a few different things in the context of metatherapy of like, first off, it seems to me like, I, I don't know whether you, you yourself would want to categorize it as a self-therapy technique or not. Like, it mm -hmm. um, doesn't really matter to me, but you know, like, but I, I would be curious why you decide one way or the other, but and just like almost from like a like librarian perspective, like, ooh, does it fit in the category or not? Uh, yeah. But um, however, I would say that like meta can have therapeutic effects, first of all. Yeah. Um, I've seen that in my own mind. Second, I think it can be difficult for people for reasons, you know, you sort of alluded to. Um, and I think that the frame that you're having on meta therapy, like, maybe points to a lot of reasons why that might be the case, like more robustly than I've seen elsewhere. I would be, basically when you write a version of this, I like out, I might be interested to like Rafan and be like, oh, does this explain, I've been sort of collecting case studies in my head of like what kinds of difficulties people have with meta. Um, mm. And like, does this give a more robust explanation to that than like, or and more fundamental. Um, so I'm curious about that. And then thirdly, uh, let's see, what is this here? Um, Oh yeah, this is the third thing. To me, it seems important that like in the same way that we we're talking about soul being a piece that was missing for you or you know whatever you want to talk about that in whatever direction but like meaning making, sense of identity, values, vision, direction um in the same way that that seems to be a critical component of like a really flourishing spiritual practice self self therapy stuff, self work, mm -hmm. whatever. I'd say that like, for me, as far as I can tell, how do I want to put this? I, I, I bet what I'm about to say is something I would, I'll put differently in the future, but I'll, uh, I'll try it out now, which is like, sure. to me, any, mm, any vision of 
like an end state or goal or direction for this kind of work should include something along the lines of like a very broadly, very broadly, like love and service uh, mm -hmm. and like connection to others and community and the larger world. And like, uh, and I should, it maybe, maybe the problems with like should, it's like not from a, not strictly from a moral reason. Like, although that, I think that's true as well, but like, mm -hmm for it to actually be satisfying on a soul dimension like you need to have a dimension of service as far as i can tell and connection to others and mm -hmm. like compassion for others and love for others and like yeah. if it doesn't have that it's not checking that box like for you right. you know <laughs> like from a self-oriented perspective um like not not i think the moral dimension is also true like i would put my moralistic cards on that as well but i think sure. like from a perspective of like even just fulfillment personally, like it will not be fulfilling if it doesn't include some dimension of service or love. Um, yeah. And so from that perspective, I'm like, uh, like the, 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 reason, the reason to do any of this stuff isn't, um, I, I don't know, just to like feel better about yourself or like suffer a little less, like that's good. I, I like, that's good. There's nothing wrong with that, but like that yeah. alone will not be deeply satisfying and fulfilling as far as I can tell. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I like the, <laughs> the I like the, the the vision of like, yeah, love, love and yeah. service. And I guess the way that I see the stuff I've already written in mm -hmm. metatherapy as being relevant to that is like for me, things that are sort of generally along, along the lines of emotionally unblocking or even somatically unblocking. Like I've had experiences of, you know, for example, crying something out and then finding that I spontaneously experience enormous amounts of gratitude and love and just and desire to be of service. And that stuff just kind of arises naturally once a bunch of other stuff gets out of the way. That's been my experience. And that's been sort of, that for me is sort of where where the love yes. stuff, it just kind of shows up at some point once you yes. clear out a bunch of other stuff and you're like, oh, I just actually love people. This is yeah. so great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just there. It's been there the whole time. And so, that, that's part of what I am pointing to when I say I feel very new to the deliberate cultivation of that yes. sort of state, but like re getting to it sort of by making space for it is something right. I feel more comfortable. I'm like, ah, I can like make space for it and just sort of wait for it to arise. And like, ah, there it is. There is the love that I feel for people and so forth. That's very and, well said and super helpful. Yeah. 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 And so there is, there is on the other hand, this question of like, um, related to this identity and vision stuff that I'm kind of starting to, to, to confront this week. Like one could choose to cultivate an identity as a person who is loving and of service. And one mm -hmm. could choose to cultivate a vision of a world where like people become more loving and mm -hmm. become better able to serve. And like, it does seem like Meta could fit very naturally into such an identity and such a mm -hmm. vision. Like if mm -hmm. you're just like, yeah, that's my vision. I really mm -hmm. want the world to be filled with love and service. That's like fucking, that's just, wouldn't that be fucking awesome? Mm -hmm. And like, why wouldn't we just deliberately cultivate that? Mm -hmm. I think you, it, this was the struggle I went through was like, I wanted to have a relationship to the Bodhisattva vows in particular, but mm -hmm. the, the like received association that I had was emotionally painful for me and made me feel shame and guilt and inadequate inadequacy mm. and like i had to find a way of holding that same vow those vows that was the opposite experience of that it was empowering mm. and encouraging mm -hmm. and healthy and i did that yeah. i did that work but like nice. i think i suspect that for a lot of people the words like love or service like might not be resonant but like mm. i i would say that um how to put this yeah, it's like worth taking the time to find words and like a myth or a story or a narrative that like is actually resonant and feels good and is in, in inspiring and enlivening. And, and probably that, especially in our culture, like that won't be a, a, like an off the shelf narrative, <laughs> you know, like, um, and this, this is maybe where stories come in. It's like, why, why, why did this story resonate with me so much? Like, oh, I want to be the kind of friend that like my other friends like are grateful to have in their life. Like this character was a really good friend and I wanna be like that. Like maybe that's a more inspiring way to hold the same thing, but I think it's helpful. Yeah, so two things. One, I think it's helpful to have that directionally of like, yeah, this is the direction. Like you have to find your own 
way towards it. You have to find your own language, your own myth. You know, the, the way I, I, no one could have told me the way to hold the Bodhisattva vows that resonated for me. Um, right. Not that someone needs the Bodhisattva vows in particular, but that's, that's like one way of framing this direction. Right. Right. Um, and then second, I, in my own path, found it useful to, yeah, basically like fake it until I make it with this direction of like, yeah. for me, it was actually, it was actually in retrospect, I think useful to like go through a somewhat forcey thing around meta and be like, may all beings be happy. May all beings be happy, which yeah. like is not the language that resonates for me now, believe it or not. It's like, I had right. to, you know, find my own stuff, but like just trying that out and like, oh, this was helpful for trying to go in that direction. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. And actually, the some some of the men's group coaches had very glowing things to say about fake it till you make it. They're like, yeah, mm -hmm. fake it till you make it is actually awesome. That's, mm -hmm. that's you like, I don't remember the wording they used, but the thing I got out of it was like, that's you like practicing a new way of being mm -hmm. that you want yes. for yourself. And that's I'd say like, like don't force it until you make it. But like, if it's <laughs> like, to the extent that you're not forcing it, like faking it is good. Yeah. 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 Just like trying out a new, in the same way you would try out like a new dance or like a new, just yes. like a new. Yeah. So there's, there, this is again, like, again, this is, this is the sort of thing I'm like, this seems good. This seems like rich and important and I haven't been doing it. And I feel again, like new to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I will say that I think the, the sort of like hearing you talk about Meta has, has had kind of like slowly piqued my interest over the, over the, I guess the years, over the years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so the thing that I have been doing like that, I guess, is, is again, sort of noticing moments when my thoughts spontaneously tend in that direction. Like, oh, I like, I want something yes. for this person. Yeah. And uh, I could imagine just kind of, uh, I really like the thing that you've been saying about like finding very specific individual phrasings of like may all beings, you know, like- Or images. Some people seem images. to resonate more with images than yeah. phrases and like phrases are just categorically not gonna work for them, so. I could see that, yeah. yeah. So for me, I think the, the version of relating to that that would feel good for me is like first of all just noticing what the spontaneous ones are just like what do i spontaneously find myself wishing for other mm -hmm. people and then kind of like trying to integrate that into a broader vision mm -hmm. of like how would i like the world to be like what kinds of goodness do i generally wish for people in the world and then i could see i could see it feeling good to to attempt to deliberately cultivate that vision of like uh, here's a vision of a world, and I'm sort of, I'm sort of starting to do this already. Mm -hmm. Of like, ah, like imagine a world in which, you know, as we mentioned, like people can like unfurl themselves and experience mm. like the the fullness of, of of the human experience. Like that, I would I would I would be happy to 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 wish to wish that of people mm -hmm. actively. Like mm -hmm. that would that would feel good for me. Like yeah, I yeah. could do, I could I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is what you're describing now of like one noticing what you're spontaneously drawn towards and then intentionally doing that mm. anyway. Uh, and I'm paraphrasing there, but like, is that, is the direction you're talking about now? Uh, it, it reminds me of some of the stuff in Mark's protocols, like, but a very specific way of applying that to Meta. Does that, does that resonate for you or? Yeah, yeah. How would you translate what you're describing into sort of like protocol language? Uh, I mean, this is sort of cheating because I think so many things can be described this way, but it's like a, a wayfinding kind of approach. Like, mm -hmm. I, like, what if I sort of way found my way around this, this whole, uh, area of meta and like mm -hmm. found sort of like found a, found a, a way to approach it that like felt good and resonant with me, mm -hmm. uh, which I think I, is what I've been kind of like slowly, quietly doing. In the background. Are there any like, um, it's funny because I, I have the sense as you say that that like meta is sort of like home territory for me and like wayfinding is home territory for you or something and like yeah. we're kind of like having a dialogue across languages or, or cultures or yeah. something and yeah. I'm wondering like what's a what's a I imagine you have sort of um like native intuitions or metaphors around wayfinding that might be useful to surface here like oh, are there any yeah. metaphors that come to mind for that that like actually resonate for you yeah that's a good question so actually the first thing that came to mind is this thing of like uh like in math one thing you could do is just sort of 
take other people's word for it that various things are true you'd be like mm-hmm. yeah someone proved x you're like okay i really i guess i could believe that now mm-hmm. and uh, as opposed to that they're sort of like working through the proof on your own like going through all the details by yourself and just making sure you actually understand and mm-hmm. believe all the steps mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and like and for me like that this is i don't know if this metaphor is going to appeal to a lot of other people but for me this is like a very rich a very rich metaphor because like when i work through a proof of, of, a, of a statement like my appreciation for that statement deepens considerably like yes. i really feel like i understand why it's true like why it has to be this way and wayfinding is not exactly like that but it has sort of a similar quality for me of like i really like to work things out on my own i don't mm-hmm. like to take other people's word for things mm-hmm. and uh mark also has language for this he talks about like things being more or less error checked um, mm. like Maybe someone tells you to attend to the breath for a thousand hours and you just do it, um, which, which would be like a not, that's like not wayfinding, that's like not error checked. Whereas Mark might suggest like explore the breath, explore mm-hmm. ways in which you might like to breathe or might explore the different effects the different kinds of breath has, has on you and like maybe start breathing a certain way and for a while and seeing how that is. And if you change your mind, you try breathing a different way for a while and seeing how that is and sort of like, checking for yourself what feels good and what feels bad and like trusting that on some level like you trusting that you you get to decide what to do you get to decide what feels good you get to decide like how to navigate the question of what to do like based on like how things feel and it's Mm -hmm. like um, Mm -hmm. which really appeals to me again as a as a person who likes to figure things out on his own and likes to do his own work and likes to not take other people's work for things Mm -hmm. Uh, I see it as like for among other things, like this is sort of a way to combat uh, subtle kinds of coercion, like if other people, you know, if you have a guru who's like trying to force you to do a lot of things, a lot of like weird practices and you're like, actually, I don't, mm. I don't want to do that. Or like people have these experiences. Mark talks about this a bit um, of like being really forcey with meditation of like, Oh, I have to attend to the breath. I have to attend to the breath. And like, trying to kind of force themselves to obey a very specific meditation instruction and like Mm. in the worst case like driving themselves psychotic on a retreat or something like that Mm. and for me i see this kind of wayfinding approach and this kind of like attending to like okay but what actually like how do i actually want to navigate this territory as as among other things a way to to counter that sort of thing Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm. Mm. that makes sense i think um there's so much to reflect on here, but like, yeah. yeah, so maybe I'm I'm reflecting on what my motivations are for asking this. And one is I want to, in general, understand, okay, okay. So to take a step back, I think like for me, when I was introduced to meditation, like the default was follow the breath or do body scans. It was very somatic. It was what we, what you might call an observation practice of like noticing what things are rather than a cultivation practice, which is creating things. That's mm. good. Body awareness has been extremely important for me. And it's like hard and boring and sometimes <laughs> painful. And like, yeah. it took me a very long time to get to my own relationship to those techniques that like was resonant for me. Mm. Um, and I think that starting with Meta might have been better. Uh, that it would have been more fun. And also a lot of the reason that it was hard was various psychological blocks and, um, you know, self-loathing or, um, you know, just different psychological patterns that Meta is like very soothing for, you know? So it would have been more fun and easier. Mm-hmm. And like, certainly when I did get kicked off with Meta, I was like, oh, this is, this is great. It was like delightful for me once I got the hang of Meta in a way that yeah. many other practices haven't been. Like, it, like you, it's straight up like, I, I mean, part of the reason subconsciously, I think I wanted to get interested in meditation was like, oh, there are these things called drugs that if you take them, they make you really happy and life is good. <laughs> and I want to figure out how to do that without the drugs. Like, cause there's no problem with drugs, but like, it seems like I could do that anyway. And like oh, Meta is the best thing I found for that. It's like, That's awesome. it just straight up yeah. makes you happy. <laughs> so, uh, so like for me, it's like, yes, this is the thing. It makes me happy. Um, which is what I was looking for. But also, yeah, it seems like less, like it would have been a better starting place for me psychologically, Mm -hmm. I think. And I think that's the case for many people and not everyone. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know, some percentage of people, maybe you, that's not the best starting point. And so for those people, I wanna like help them if and when Meta is good, like how do you face the things that are difficult? 
Um, mm. And, you know, if, if it is something that you're interested in doing. And from that perspective, I think there's two things that this is highlighting for me. One is, yeah, definitely don't force it. Like I, I would never advise forcing Meta. I wouldn't. Right. No, just don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like forcing, no. But then the second thing is, okay, if you're not forcing it, like a lot of the times, especially if it's top poorly, which this is another reason I want to teach is like, I think it's top poorly a lot of the time. And I, mm -hmm. frankly, I think I could do a much better job. I think I do do yeah. a much better job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I don't know. Anyway, I don't mean to be anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but like, if it's top poorly or you just don't have the hang of it yet, it can be boring and dry. Even mm -hmm. if you're not forcing it, it's like, well, what's yeah. happening there. And I think from that perspective, like, yeah, I'm reminded of like a lot of the stuff with like biomotive of like learning to notice whether feelings res like phrases resonate and like you can yeah. have phrases or images that like don't resonate and you can have phrases or images that do and what you want to do is if you're not forcing it don't force it but if you're not forcing it you want to as quickly as possible find the images and or phrases that do resonate for you and then just like go you know like keep going yeah, in yeah, that direction yeah. and 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 feel that as much as possible let it inform your actions let it inform the way you live your life and if you do that like not only are you happy but like you're a better person your life is amazing like basically you put yourself in a metaphorical heavenly realm where like <laughs> your things are really good so i want to help people get there and so yeah this is like clarifying some of the obstacles there that people might have or like either with forcing it or like it not resonating yeah yeah like i think one one of the many things that really excites me about about wayfinding as an idea is the way in which it feels so kind of maximally flexible like some mm -hmm. might say too flexible but the way in which it feels so uh it feels compassionate to me to acknowledge that people have many different starting places and they have many different blocks to doing many different things and that mm. people just need different things and wayfinding i feel like is the maximal like you people need different things it's mm. like you are allowed to find out what you need mm -hmm. and do that instead of doing what anyone else is telling you uh, so that, that's that's Beautiful. that to me is like a the, the compassionate dimension of it mm -hmm. uh, i also had one other just thought about how to explain the distinction better which so using stretching as both a metaphor and just an example um like i feel like the way i was taught to stretch in school was like i should try to make my body take a certain position mm. and you know like they demonstrated position and i would like attempt to make that position and if i didn't if i couldn't do it then i had failed <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. like if i couldn't touch my touch my foot with my hand or whatever then like mm -hmm. i wasn't doing the stretch right i was like oh i should like feel bad for not doing the stretch right and it wasn't until like maybe literally a few months ago that i like went back to stretching as a thing at all and was like okay i think i kind of need to stretch some stuff now but like mm. how do, should i do it and i like came to i like i noticed or maybe i read somewhere i was like oh i think i should just kind of like stretch something until like right past the point it feels good and then it kind of just like hang out there for a little while and then i should kind of wait for the muscle to relax or like loosen and if it doesn't do that i should just i should like maybe be even more gentle, like hang back a little bit further. And then I started doing experimenting with stuff like that. I was like, oh, this is actually working. Mm. Like, unlike the stretching I was doing uh -huh. in yeah. school, which yeah. just made me feel bad. Like, this is actually working. Like, I'm actually loosening up my muscles and this actually feels good. Um, and that for me is like, a again, both a metaphor and an example of wayfinding. Like, what mm. is, like, what are the ways in which my body can move? And like, which of them feel good? And which of them temporarily feel bad? But then if I hang out there, they come to, then they feel good. And like, what are sort of, what's sort of like my experience of, of like being the stretcher as opposed to like, so this kind of like very bottom up organic, like, let me explore the ways that my body can move and how much better I can feel if I move the right ways, as opposed to like, I'm going to try to like, I think someone on Twitter says something like, I try to contort my body into a shape <laughs> mm -hmm. like, um, and try to like compete with other people to see whose body can contort the most, <laughs> whatever. This probably applies to yoga too. Like I, you know, people, I think there's, there's occasionally some discourse on Twitter about people like forcing themselves in yoga and like getting injuries and stuff instead of like, whatever, like the, th the, the cool thing that yoga is supposed to be doing instead, uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. which yeah. I don't feel qualified to talk about, but sure. Sure. Oh, that's really helpful. Yeah. That's a great analogy for it. And, um, yeah, don't force it and have fun. 
yeah. Uh, but don't uh, force the fun either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so complicated. <laughs> I've started um, to, I've, I've, I'm leaning towards just not giving instructions of any kind. Ever. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's funny. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. I'm curious if like at the, like, so, so we've sort of like covered a lot of ground with the meta therapy stuff. And it's also been a few months since you made this outline, mm -hmm. uh, where both in general and at this end of this conversation, do you stand with like some of these concepts or like where, where do you think you'll go from here with this direction? That's a good question. I was thinking about this a little today. So uh, first off, like, I don't know. Mm -hmm, <laughs> I feel mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm like reevaluating some stuff related to mm -hmm. this. Um, I think the original kind of uh, vision I had in mind for metatherapy was a kind of more technical manual of just like here are all, a bunch of options that you have and they're not the only options like part of the, the thing i'm hoping to to get to say in there at some point is like you get to add stuff to this list like this mm. is not supposed to be this is just all the stuff i know about mm -hmm. and for example meta is not currently on the list like mm -hmm. someone reading the document should be able to be like you to like add the stuff that they discovered that i don't know about yet mm. uh, it's it's hopefully supposed to be an extensible framework in that way mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I had in mind sort of a more technical document that would be more just like, here are some things you can do, here are some more resources you can check out to learn more about the things that you can do. Um, and I feel less drawn to doing it that way now. I ha I've wondered if I should just write several different versions of this. Um, maybe one of them should be a technical document, but I would like to write something kind of more artistic or more poetic mm -hmm. or like actually more similar to the to the Substack post, mm -hmm. just like something a little <clears throat> more more uh, autobiographical. Even like I could talk mm -hmm. about by instead of trying to like lay out all these sort of abstract details, I could be like I could just talk about my own personal experience. I could be like, here's sort of my experience trying to learn how to do therapy on myself, and here's all the things I picked up, and here are the challenges I ran into along the way. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another version of this document that could a quite different version of this document that would be like much more personal and. That one sounds kind of more fun to write. <laughs> oh, that's that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. go in that direction. I think yeah. it would it, it would end up covering, I think, some of the same ground, but like in a much more kind of grounded and and, and uh, humanized way instead of mm -hmm. this kind of like forbidding abstraction. Uh, so that's, I, I that's would like a, just for what it's worth, I would be interested in. Well, one, I, I would be interested in whatever is like actually available to you and is fun and like continues it so if that's more fun definitely but yeah i would be interested in both and like they would both be useful yeah, yeah. to me and interesting. I, could, I maybe should just write both <laughs> uh, yeah start with the fun that's one tricky. though yeah 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 it's tricky like I, I i guess one thing that i might have to do with the manual is to get is to like clarify to myself who it's aimed at mm. um, because i i think i have a sort of vague sense of it it's like people who were like me um, mm. but it could mm -hmm. it could be a lot it could be a lot clearer like one thing i'm thinking about is maybe specifically uh like maybe specifically people dealing with complex trauma because i think mm. complex trauma is like particularly gnarly um uh, and like has particularly many sort of pernicious effects and particularly i think needs needs a sort of um what's word like a sort of customized approach Mm. In, at least in my experience, like I have, I have felt like I, you know, whatever, whatever was, go whatever you want to call, whatever problems I was having, like I needed to customize my approach to myself very extensively. Like I couldn't really take anything, any individual thing off the shelf. Like I had to just, like the stuff that I've, that I've been doing to kind of get to the relatively stable place I am right now, I had to mix like five things, you know? uh -huh. <laughs> like, uh -huh. so many things. Uh, totally. So that's, that's a thought about that. There is also a question of like, like part of the, this is also kind of related to the wayfinding discussion. Like part of, part of my sense of the intended audience is like people who either can't work with a therapist, like they can't find one that they like enough or they can't afford to work with one or, you know, some other, re like maybe they're just, for whatever reason, they have some kind of block around, around finding someone uh, to get help from. And like, that also describes me and myself. Like I have been mm. extremely reluctant to, to work with a therapist. Um, I actually stand by that decision. I think mm -hmm. I'm, I think I'm okay with the consequences for me. Um, mm -hmm. that's because 
instead of working with a therapist, I was willing to like, just learn a bunch of therapy stuff on my own. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't expect that everybody will want to do that, but Mm -hmm. this, the document might be sort of aimed towards the kinds of people who would like to do something like that. Would mm-hmm. be like I would rather reinvent therapy than talk uh-huh. to the therapist. <laughs> Men will literally like, reinvent therapy rather than Men will literally therapy. reinvent therapy. You have to tweet that. Please tweet that. Please. Uh, no, no. Uh, uh, not yet. <laughs> not I mean, yet. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll keep it in mind. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. That's so good. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. I think that's that's like a big thing with Mark's document as well. It's like people mm-hmm. who would rather do it on their re- reinvent spirituality yeah. rather than go rather, to a spiritual teacher. Exactly. Thing, exactly. You know? I think I think I once actually described med- Mark's stuff as like meditation for people who don't trust anybody. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> and metatherapy could simply be similar to be therapy for people who don't trust anybody. <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is there anything that's like near the territory that we've talked about so far that you'd like to talk about more or nothing that immediately comes to mind i'm very tired yeah yeah <laughs> I've had too. a long week for sure yeah <laughs> this has been this has been great like i i've enjoyed like you you seem very energized in this conversation when we've been talking about like meta and stuff and it's just it's been fun getting to hang out with that energy but also like yeah my, brain is, my brain totally. is empty <laughs> me too me too yeah yeah, well, thank you so much. I feel so com- like very complete with like, I don't know, yeah, when we had the conversation last time, it was like, felt like half of a thing. And this feels like the yeah. second half. So cool. I'm very glad yeah. we got to have it. And uh, awesome. yeah, thanks for talking to me. Really appreciate it, friend. Yeah, you're welcome. This is really fun. Okay. <laughs>